So what is this exactly? Well, this is a compilation. This is the first time I've ever done one of these, but it's all of the documentaries I've done on New York, all put into one video. So you guys are interested, definitely, definitely watch it all the way through. If you got time, you know, throw, throw it on. If you're working, throw this on, but, um, it's also chronological. So you're going to, there's a, it's really interesting, honestly. And this is the, this is the place that I've done the most cannabis documentaries, you know, on collectively. So in terms of like, you know, one city, so big shouts out to New York, man. Can't tell you guys enough. Every time I've gone out there, everyone treats me. The, the hospitality out there is actually amazing. And uh, really, like seriously, like, mad love to all y'all. But um, I want to say too, guys, if you guys have not signed up for the High Design streaming platform, go to www.highdesign.media. We are going to be now, you know, I know these documentaries that I put out could take a long time to make, but we're actually going to be putting out the raw interviews. They're, we're already doing that, actually. The raw interviews, the day of or the day after that we do, you know, the interview so that if you want to follow along, if you want to, you know, understand exactly, you know, how, what we're doing to craft these documentaries, if you want the information right away, you know, you don't want to wait a couple months or however long it may take, guys, go sign up. All paying subscribers, they're going to be, you know, getting access to literally all of the interviews I do real time you're also gonna be able to help contribute because we're gonna have discussions we're gonna you're gonna be able to help me craft some of these documentaries but you know the, the the spray pack documentary is coming up and i know new york that's another big thing in new york definitely go check it out guys we we already got interviews up there with doja pack a bunch of other people that are talking about the spray pack stuff so go check it out guys www.highdesign.media and also i will say this too we just released the very first time, for the very first time, finally, it took a minute, but we released the High Design by LMC streaming platform app on the iOS store. So if you got an iPhone, just look, just search HDX LMC. You could download the app. You could stream, you know, on the go. You can download episodes, a bunch of other stuff. So go check it out, guys. Really appreciate you guys. Anyways, big shouts out to New York. Big shouts, big shouts out to the East Coast. And I hope you guys enjoy this. Anyways, this is LMC. I'll see y'all later. The trap has changed, the routes have shifted, but almost always the goal stayed the same. And that's to get to the chicken, count up the green, collect the dead presidents, become old friends with Benjamin Franklin, getting the cheddar, the skrilla, the cabbage, I could go on and on. But making money has always been the incentive for the trap. Moving products to one place from another and making money on marginal difference in cost and wholesale. And what city is absolutely one of the most obsessed with getting to the bag? Well, that of course is the Big Apple, New York City. Now this video is a TTS or a Trap Tree series episode, but it's actually a collaboration between my other series and that of High Design, more specifically High Design History. So in this TTS High Design History episode, we finna cover the history and progression of New York's trappers and pushers in regards to this plant and how it has affected the current day and potentially the future. Because in a lot of ways, if we look below the surface, the trap is playing a major role in the legal markets today and that of brand building and overall financial stability. Please make sure to hit the like button, share this video, subscribe, and follow me on all the social medias. The links are down below. Welcome to this Trap Tree Series X High Design History episode. This is LMC. Let's run it. New York City is one of the most expensive places to acquire property, especially if we're talking about places like Manhattan. Now, why is property so expensive? Well, there's a number of variables, but overall it comes down to there being a lot of people being in the same place, which therefore affects supply and demand. More people with no increase in housing means higher cost for rent. Now for years, New York, given its massive population of just under 8.5 million people, is and always has been one of the most lucrative and therefore most sought after markets in the United States. And for trappers, well, they are not the exception. So let's start this story in New York during the 1960s and 1970s. So if you haven't seen the high design history episode I did on Branson, I highly recommend you go watch that video. It will give you a better understanding of some of the stuff I'm going to mention in this first half of the video. But in that video in regards to Branson, I talked about how the 1960s and 1970s really was all about importing of this illicit plant into the US really came from three to four countries. The Vietnam War would bring in a time in New York where the tie stick or the tie had a large market share of the New York market, but there also was the Jamaicans, Colombians, and Mexicans. 
that were the other major countries that helped supply America with more than 75 to 80% of its flour at the time, which stayed really that way until uh, around the 90s. Miami is and has been to this day the main entrance for pushers and movers to get their flour into the eastern United States and more specifically into New York. The Colombians pushed their Colombian gold through Miami as well as the Jamaicans and more specifically in regards to Jamaican groups like the Zion Coptic Church and Brother Love. Well, those people were very big players in the 1970s. By the way, if you haven't watched the Trap Tracer episode I did on Brother Love, definitely go watch that. But typically that era consists of the traditional smuggling tactics utilized by Colombians and Americans, which consisted of utilizing fleets of ships disguised under shell companies and or they use airplanes, right? That was the initial transportation uh, strategy. And then once it reached Miami, there'd be many different couriers or drivers that would head all over the Eastern seaboard to distribute the flour. And so this would, you know, this has been going on forever. Now from the 1960s all the way up to the late 1980s, early 1990s, New York's main distribution style was a typical trap. Music studios, a lot, you know, because I own music studios. That was my way of doing it, you know what I mean? I own a music studio, Bronx, my hand. I could bust my moves here, I could bust my moves there. It gave both sides a comfortability of doing business, you know what I'm saying? So and then I, before that, it was blocks, you know? You had to come to a block, go in the building, Buy your shit, get out of there, leave police. The old fashioned travel. Yeah. The old fashioned way, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Where people are on a block or in a building or in an open air market, mainly being in parks like Grand Central Park, serving people, because really delivery was much harder to do given the lack of the internet and or personal cell phones being widely available across the population there. A small block called Creston. But it's, it was a big, like, you could walk over there, you'll have like 20 people walk up on you with Ziploc bags, talk about they got it, you know what I'm saying? That it became popular and everybody used to come to Preston to get a dime from the Red Building, if you know what I'm talking about. Shout out to Tone and the gang, you already know what it is, man. BX shit. But we don't keep that low, so we know what it is, you know? Preston, everybody know Preston back in the days in the 90s when shit started. So for the business to work, you needed to have the trap open consistently on blocks and or buildings, right? These buildings would range from being full on traps or they would be front businesses. Like for example, music studios were utilized as well as bodegas and other businesses as well. And instead of blocks or bandos, front businesses became more utilized in the 90s. Now why is that? Well in the 90s, New York had a lot of problems with crime and a young Rudy Giuliani, the mayor, alongside his chief of police, well they begin to start New York's notorious stop and frisk era in the 90s, also known as broken windows policing. Meaning that police could just see you walking on the street and they could stop you and question you and they typically targeted, you know, people of color and, it, you know, looking back on it, it really was a pretty bad law, but that is what happened. And so people had to adapt, right? The NYPD were now legally allowed to search and frisk anyone they so choose, meaning that jugging on the block or on the street out in the open was much more risky. So just like they always do, the trappers, the pushers, the movers, they adapted. When it comes to the 1990s, really, well, Canada started to come into the fray. Canada really started to make its impact on the U.S. markets with beasters flooding down into the U.S., as well as many of the seeds now, with the rise of the Beasters, or the BC Buds, came a shift in transport routes, making New York's St. Regis Mohawk Indian tribe one of the most important players in the East Coast illicit plant trade, given that their reservation was the perfect real estate to move hundreds of thousands of units from Canada into New York, which to this day is still a critical smuggling link. Now, the end of the 90s in New York was in many ways the start of a more sophisticated, decent our distribution networks. With the advent of the internet and more access to personal cell phones, these forced adaptations as well as technological and societal changes marks the precursor to the modern era of the trap in New York and in many places around the country. Now for New York in the early to mid 2000s, we see the rise of the Purple Haze movement with Crippy coming up the East Coast from Miami to New York. While we also see the very beginning stages of trappers utilizing the mail to receive packs from California and other West Coast markets, now, while sending packs in the mail was most likely done very, very early on, probably 
you know, you know, could have been done in the 60s, 70s, 80s. We don't really know. I do believe that sending packs through the mail really spiked and became a modern practice for trappers to utilize the mail starting in the early 2000s, right? Maybe around the mid 2000s, 2004 to 2005. But it really became mainstream during the 2010s with the rise of Silk Road and other dark web marketplaces becoming more known to the general public as well as the expansion of online internet forums and overall internet use by the general public. In the 2000s in New York, the emergence of delivery services exploded in numbers. While these delivery services can be traced back to the early 1980s, they didn't really become super popular until the early 2000s. In 2005, the famous delivery and distribution group named after the TV network Cartoon Network would get rolled up by the feds and they would all catch a charge. Now, if we look at the Cartoon Network organization, it was a system that had multiple layers of protocol to ensure the safety of the entire organization. This is literally a company that would supply 50,000 plus uh, customers and they had to use, you know, code words and a bunch of other, you know, safety precautions. In a 2007 Forbes article on the Cartoon Network, journalist Monte Burke writes, quote, no longer does most of the flour come in French connection style. By the ton on boats or tractor trailers, the trade starts with small amounts, mostly grown regionally and moves through multi-level distributors. Like the internet, this kind of distribution channel has many nodes of activity and no fixed hub. A broken link hardly slows the operation at all. Dealers use pagers, cell phones, and PDAs to create from this topology, a sophisticated and very lucrative network. The key is having several layers of agents between the grower and the buyer, and making it inherently difficult for enforcement to connect the dots. The operation can even continue when its leaders are in jail." End quote. Now, these private delivery models were, and still to this day, are used in markets where this plant is still prohibited or is in a major gray market. When I personally was working in the medical market in Seattle in 2013, 2015, I worked for delivery services that had a similar model. And then I eventually started my own where everyone, you know, had a code name. No one really knew everyone by their actual name besides one or two people that were actually running the call center, the entire, you know, the, the HQ, right? As time has progressed, many of these trafficking organizations have moved more towards these decentralized models to a certain degree, given the fact that it's just way more safe and it prevents the total collapse of the entire organization. Now, let's get back to New York. In around the 2010s, we can start to see a heavy increase in the amount of packs that were being mailed over to New York. And after my home state of Washington, alongside Colorado, legalized fully for recreational in around 2012, 2013, the number of packs being sent from those states all over the country, well, those dramatically increased, trust me. In a 2017 article from US News, the title of the article says, mail intercepts 18% higher last year. The average weight of bus and number of mail arrests, however, continue to fall. Now, just based off that headline and the study that's with, you know, utilized you know, in, in the article, I'll link the article down below, by the way, we can see that mailing has dramatically gone up and the number of people doing it has increased. Now, given New York legalized this year and is heading into the recreational regulated market, but that still won't happen for around at least another year or so. So New York is at a really interesting time right now. I recently traveled to New York last week to better understand what was happening and the overall atmosphere of this new emerging market. I have to say, if you're able to travel to New York right now to experience this unique time, I highly recommend you do. To so the legal market, you guys were the first to, to you know, put your foot in the door and let us and show us what's, what it is, you know what I'm saying? And now, New York is different over here because, you know, everybody that comes here is like, damn, this shit reminds me of Cali when it first got legalized, you know what I'm saying? And when I hear people say that in my mind, I'm thinking like, damn, we don't want to get like how it is, so we got to make sure we do the right thing, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Let's yeah. not fall now, for those who aren't aware of what I mean is every time a market legalizes recreationally, there is a buffer period where the market hasn't fully opened for recreational, but the plant has been legalized, meaning it's in this really weird limbo gray market where it's pretty much the wild, wild west. I mean, for God's sakes, they are literally people setting up stands in New York and just selling their bag of flour on the street like they're you know, at a hot dog stand or something. Now, then again, I guess that did happen back in the 1980s and, you know, 
prior, but it's very, very prevalent now. Until there is tax money being collected, there will be no enforcement. The lounges and the trap shops all over the city of New York are absolutely insane. It was really dope to visit them and really brought back some great memories of my high school days where I was working in medical in Seattle, where we actually had, you know, lounges and, and dab bars and all that stuff, right? Because the ability to have a place where people can consume together is a great way to build a strong community and, you know, a great platform for people to network and, and do business together. Now, what's extremely different about the old medical days in Seattle and what's currently happening in New York is that, well, obviously it's New York, which is a massive market. But really, what's different is that New York entered into this limbo gray market at a time where many other states had legalized and have been building brands for the long term has become one of the main focuses. See, New York has been getting flooded with California brands, most likely all sent through the mail because, well, Cali brands understand the importance of getting market share in New York, given the size of the market. But it's also been a mechanism for where many of these California brands are able to stay afloat financially because of the backdooring they've been able to do, you know, to places like New York. Now, this is starting to change. But if we look back only a couple years ago at the start of the pandemic, a lot of the pushing of packs into New York dramatically slowed down. Literally no one was pushing except a small group of brands and people who would start making millions of dollars a week. And I really just say that because one, well, that's a story that we're probably gonna cover here in the, in the far future. Um, but two, these are brands and companies that really benefited from this in the sense where they made so much money that it helped bolster them up in many other states around the country. I mean, everybody started getting money because, you know, all the PPPs and all these all the PPPs, shit yeah. that people were getting money that they never got, so they were buying work. And we'll we'll touch on that story here in the future when the time is right. And now that the pandemic is kind of coming to a close, that window of opportunity isn't there anymore. It's now being flooded into New York, right? I had such a dope trip to New York recently, and I'll be going back there very soon, but I wanted to discuss the history of New York's trap and how it has affected today. And I think New York is a great learning lesson slash place to observe because this is all going to happen in other states in the near future. And by understanding how people leveraged this newly opened market and that of New York to really help skyrocket their brand, well, maybe you could take what you learned in this video or through your own observations and apply it to the next major opening of a big market and utilize that gray limbo period as a vehicle to either build your brand or make money to help, you know, your legal brand stay afloat or both. Just some fruit for thought. It's all about timing, taking advantage of the certain timing because that can make all the difference. I want to say big shouts out to New York and New Jersey. Y'all are the truth. I'm very, very excited to go back to New York in a month or so as of this recording. And if you're in New York and you see this video, do not hesitate to tap in with your boy. Make sure to follow me on all the Instagrams, Twitter, Discord, and more. The links are down below in the description. Anyways, this was a TTS high design history episode on the past, present, and future of the New York market and the trap. Make sure you hit the like button, share this, and comment down below. This is LMC, signing out. chance to do something we're gonna go crazy yeah <laughs> you know what i'm saying 100%. like and that's the thing man hustle is different bro hustle is definitely like i said we move at a fast pace new york yeah. is always on the go like always on the go like it's no slowing down here you know 100 24 hours city of bright lights and jay could have not said it any better than that city that don't sleep here for real money's huh? always revolving here <laughs> at all times
mean, you put that in your hand. Put no, put your bag. Put the bags that you found. All right, my mom's just found this bud. This, this bud has to be at least 20 years old. Mom, move your hand. You don't need to spread. Move your hand. Move your hand for me. This bud got don't, to don't be. Don't put my name in it, period. I'm not putting, I said mom. They don't know who mom's is. This weed has to be at least 20 years old. We selling it on eBay. You gonna say not to say your name and then say we selling it, mom? Oh, shit. All right, and now this one right here. You know what that bag is right there. This bag has history. This is Biggie Smalls. This is the locks. This is Cameron. This is Little C's. This is Noriega. Official, 20 years old, and the bud is still in it. And if you don't know what that bag is, it's from one of the East Coast riders of marijuana. Branson, baby. That's an official Branson bag. Six months ago, I put up a post on my high design Instagram profile asking which cannabis entrepreneurs I should cover. And I got a lot of different comments on the post, but there's always this one that I remembered. And the comment was saying, quote, Branson from New York, guy's an East Coast legend. Had to have a membership to get into his building to see him. All New York greats have talked about him and their music, and I mean all of them. Even Burner had a line about him in his music. End quote. Like I said, this comment stuck out to me for sure, but I filed it away in my mind. But recently, given that New York is about to launch their legal cannabis market, I remembered this comment and wanted to really find out more about Branson. Welcome to High Design History. This is LMC. Big shouts out to the East Coast and specifically Jersey and New York. This episode, well, this is for y'all. Please make sure to hit the like button, comment down below, share this video, and make sure to follow me on all the social medias. The links are down below in the description. Welcome to High Design History. The video I just showed at the beginning was a video uploaded to Twitter earlier this year where East Coast rap legend Redman finds a 20 year old bag of weed with some of them being from the famous Branson and that of his triangle bags. The stories about how hard it was to find quality weed in New York City back in the day are endless. In that era, if you weren't well connected, the high THC chronic strains that West Coast rappers bragged about were damn near mythical. But many of the best buds that did make it to the East Coast back then hit the streets in triangle shaped baggies associated with the legacy market pioneer known simply as Branson. While the triangle bag that was found by Redman and his mother was around 20 years old, well, that is literally less than half of the story. To really tell the whole story of Branson correctly, we need to go way back, back to the 1970s. Branson started his street career as a kid in New York during the 70s, growing up in Harlem. He would make his money and start to learn the game more and more. The 1970s drug trade in New York and around the country is famously interlinked with the Vietnam War. Why? Well, the American soldiers that would come back from Vietnam would bring back drugs like heroin, but they'd also bring back weed, and this weed specifically was called the tie stick. Now, there's a lot of confusion around what tie stick is, so let's break it down. Tie stick was the traditional method of layering and binding canvas buds around a stick of hemp stock, treating it with hash oil and wrapping it in fan leaves to cure underground for a month or so. Developed in northeast of Thailand, where the climate is especially generous to growing weed, it was a long and time-consuming process, and when the finished product would come out as kind of like a cigar, it's like a spliff that people would claim burned for hours and got you absolutely stoned. The Thai stick name, well, the confusion comes in because there's also the strain of the weed, which is, you know, also considered like a Landrace sativa, which is also also just simply referred to as Thai. Some say the Thai stick may come from surfers in Thailand, but that's probably not the case. The tens of thousands of GIs who were either stationed in or spent time um, roaming the Thailand, uh, you know, countryside seems like a more likely answer where they would end up, you know, finding it. Now, if we look at some of the numbers from the Department of Defense itself, which released these numbers a little after the war, it said that about 50% of GIs in Vietnam smoked marijuana during the war. 
Whether it was GIs, surfers, maybe even businessmen, or even the CIA smuggling the Thai stick into the US and Europe, the incentive was absolutely clear. What sold for $3 per kilo at the farm in Asan, which is the northeast region of Thailand, easily fetched $4,000 a kilo in any city in America in the early 1970s. It's been said thousands of tons of Thai sticks were shipped out of the country between 1968 and 1972. However it happened, Thai stick made its way to the US either as the proper smoking method or simply as buds that gained widespread devotees for its flavor and overall body high. And throughout the 1970s, one of the people making Thai stick extremely popular in New York, well, that was a very young Branson. Throughout the 1970s, Branson would see firsthand the power of finding a high quality product in another country, state, or region that cost way less there, and then smuggling it back to New York where the high quality product was in demand and could fetch a good price. Now, while Branson wasn't the one that actually was coordinating the smuggling from Vietnam into America, obviously because he was a kid at this time, he did take this understanding into the late 1970s and early 1980s as a young man. He would start to make trips out west to California where cannabis and its many varieties and qualities would be in abundance. Branson and his associates would begin to bring high quality cannabis and new types of strains back to New York. I think Branson was definitely one of the few people during this time to really look more at California than any other countries or states. According to the New York Times article from 1985, Quote, during the 1980s, growers in the United States had become the fourth largest supplier of marijuana on the streets in America, after Colombia, Mexico, and Jamaica. Now, in regards to New York's cannabis market during the 1980s, Jamaican weed was popular, and strains like the Acapulco Gold from Mexico were also really popular. And then strains like the Haze and later on the Sour Diesel would become the staple of New York's cannabis consumers, what they smoked. But this is where Branson really started to make a name for himself. One of the major themes in the story of Branson's cannabis career is that he always looked to have a unique offering. A unique offering meaning unique strains. See, what's really important to understand about the cannabis market in New York throughout the 20th century is that there weren't that many different options when it came to types of weed. And the way those types of weed were identified was also pretty broad. From the 1970s to the 1980s, the dominant types of weed were known in the streets as mainly from the place that it came from, right? The land race, i.e. Thailand and Jamaica, otherwise known as the Thai or Jamaican. From the 1980s through the 1990s, there was a shift in the identification when strains like the haze and sour diesel became the dominant types of weed being sold. But now, like I said earlier, this homogeneous domination of only a couple strains in New York played to Branson's favor. Because Branson would be going over to California and bringing back a variety of different strains, he would start to become known individually as one of the few people that had a unique selection of flavors. You could even say he had an exotic selection of strains. He had many different types of exotic strains in a city that had very few options. So throughout the 1980s, the Hayes name, and a little later on into the 90s, the Sour Diesel name, would become famous in the streets. But also, so would the name Branson. And that, my friends, well, that's what we call a person way ahead of their time. Before cannabis legalization, the first type of brands were strains, or strands. Now, I've talked about this in countless other videos I've done that in today's industry, the most valuable thing is brand equity, and within that being brand loyalty. And one major component to brand loyalty is having customers wanting to try any strain that that brand is selling. You want customers to be loyal to your brand and not a specific strain. Now in the mid to late 1980s, Branson made another move that helped separate himself from the pack which was his implementation of these unique triangle-shaped bags. He would come across a bag supplier that allowed him to order a customized bag that was shaped in a triangle. This made it so it was undeniably identifiable that it was weed coming from Branson. And this is why I say Branson was absolutely ahead of his time. People were loyal to Branson, not specific strains, 
and he had unique packaging that gave him more brand identity. Now, just like any market over time, in the 1990s, the overall drug market changed. Whether it's Nancy Reagan's Just Say No campaign in the late 80s, or Stop and Frisk in New York during the 1990s, and overall the launching of the war on drugs, the illegal drug trade changed, including cannabis. So Branson, like he has always, adapted. He made connections in the entertainment industry and actually managed Devante Swing, who was a member of the famous R&B group Jodeci, as well as some other rappers over a time period. So Branson had connections to the music industry in New York, and with the changes in the New York cannabis market in the 1990s, he pivoted to mainly supplying exotic strains of high-quality cannabis to the people in the entertainment and music world. Now, just like Branson had in the 70s and 80s, he treated his customers well, always having great customer service. People would come to him and they'd buy their kush, but they'd also hang out for a while after. Branson treated his customers like friends, because the majority of them were. And this translated extremely well over to when he started supplying famous musicians and rappers in the 1990s. If you were to ask Branson today about people like the famous rapper Notorious B.I.G., otherwise known as Biggie Smalls, he would tell you that he was a friend before anything. So this combination of great customer service and a wide selection of exotic strains made Branson New York hip hop's favorite cannabis plug. And inherently, musicians and rappers talk about people and their experiences that they have in their life. So organically, many of the rappers would start to name Branson and his exotic flavors. like shout out to my man branson he we wait up in front of their house, house you know what i'm saying so i didn't even know uh, salute the blood too because we would go to blood mural and hang out this was branson days when we were smoking the branson mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. the, the the pyramid bags and all that mm. Ooh, salute to the God. <laughs> I just got a chill on my body. I just got a chill on my body. So you show up. 94. Mm -hmm. This is Ready to Die. The album. Talk to me about the process. Like, what was it like during the making of that album? Shit was fun, dog. Shit was fun yeah? as fuck, man. I mean, we was out the streets. This one, it was real. Contract sign. Deal on the table. We got, we got some advance money. You know what I'm saying? It's more liquor now. We done, we done made the transformation from beer to liquor. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It went from, uh, you know, just regular green weed to Branson. You know, things started to change. In my opinion, I think Branson is one of the first cannabis entrepreneurs to be really embraced by hip hop and to be constantly mentioned by rappers of the 1990s, 2000s and beyond. While the hundreds, maybe even thousands of mentions of Branson and his weed throughout New York's rap songs was a pretty organic happening, I think it showcased the power of marketing strains and brands through music. Now, just like I talked about in the High Design History episode I did on Champelli on the West Coast, the infusion of cannabis brands or strains into music, like what happened with Branson on the East Coast, laid the bedrock or served as a precursor to what we see now with people like Burner and his Cookies Cannabis Empire. So it was pretty dope to see last year when Burner came to New York and said this in an interview with The Breakfast Club. I'm, I'm coming to New York for sure. We're putting all our resources into bringing cookies to New York. But what we're going to do is like the first person I partnered with in NY was Branson. Branson, mm -hmm. shout out to Branson. You know, like I, I didn't want to come out here and go right to the rappers or anything like that. Shout out to all my brothers that have been asking me to do things. But Branson has been an OG for a long time. So that was, that was the first person I wanted to do a deal with. Like, let's get them triangle bags all through the city again and have you feel comfortable about doing that. So we've been bringing him around and showing him like what the what the rec game looks like and he's blown, his mind's blown from it. I'm excited to see what Burner and Branson do in the future with their upcoming brand or strains. We'll have to see what happens. But I think it's super smart of Burner to link up with an OG like Branson. 
Not only because it's a smart business move, but because legends like Branson deserve an opportunity to operate in the legal market. And specifically for Burner, well, I'm just gonna read an excerpt from a Leafly article that was published earlier this year saying, quote, let's just say that if modern day weed mogul and cookie CEO Burner mapped his business practice and product lineage on a family tree, Branson would be his grandfather. And Burner would be the first to tell you that his genius genetics trace back to the Branson's pre-social media influence, end quote. Now, when it comes to Branson as a person, He's someone that genuinely cares about his community and has taken actions to help support the younger generations coming up. And that's what really makes someone an OG. You can be in the older generations and not be one. Branson has helped his community in many ways, but one notable example is that Branson started his own juice company. Why? Because Branson has seen over the years how the options for food and drinks have become more and more poisonous processed unhealthy foods and drinks and his juice business called Branson got juice is not only selling healthy juice drinks but also serves as a symbol for investing in the community you grew up in and wanting to create a better future for the coming generations and nowadays that's honestly pretty uncommon remember you can be old and still not an OG OGs look to mentor and help younger generations coming up. I was lucky enough to talk to Branson for a couple hours on the phone the other day. And if I had to summarize the conversation I had with him in one word, well, that word would be wisdom. Branson had longevity in an environment where that's pretty fucking hard to do. The history of New York's cannabis culture in the second half of the 20th century is the history of Branson. Big shouts out to Branson, the New York cannabis legend, and big shouts out to anyone watching this from the East Coast, especially the folks in New York and New Jersey. If you like this episode of High Design History, please make sure to hit the like button, comment, share, subscribe, and follow me on all the social medias. The links are down below in the description. Anyways, this is LMC, signing out. just out in the open it was a it was almost an open market maybe I would have got killed if I kept the business uh, and there would be four or five hundred guys out on the street hustling I'll tell you how much money was being moved there it was crazy uh, well my name is Kevin uh, known as white boy Kevin I grew up in a Dominican neighborhood uptown in Washington Heights it used to be all Irish and Jewish neighbor, but my family was the only one that didn't leave. So I was pretty much like the only Irish guy up there. So uh, I started selling weed probably around 91, somewhere around there. And then 93 Hayes came about. Well, basically, I, I would, my whole neighborhood, everybody else was Dominican. It was just me. That's why it's white boy Kev, you know, like I was the white boy. Un Blanquito, that's how everybody knew. My wife is Dominican, my kids are half Dominican, all my friends are Dominican, uh, you know, like, and then I would say about, so, there was some Dominican families, but I would say around like 83, somewhere around there, that's when like an influx came in. So within a few years, it just became a predominantly Dominican neighborhood. But, you know, everything's getting gentrified here in the city, so it's, it's, it's the restaurants, the, the atmosphere. I mean, it, it's a safer neighborhood in Washington Heights now, for sure. But even back in those days, Washington Heights was a high-class ghetto. You know, back in the days, like, my mother would get off of work at 11 o'clock, get home at 12, walk down the block. You know, like, no ladies had to get worried about get robbed, you know? You know, at, at the end of the day, like, this corner's mine. So if this kid over here robs somebody and now the cops come, now I'm shut down. So I, I, I keep that shit out, you know? So basically each block had their own bosses because, you know, uh, 
The kids from the neighborhood grew up there. They end up taking over and they got the neighborhood. And, you know, it was a high deal. At one point, I think Washington Heights was the murder capital of the world. And that was around like 88. And the murders were just out of control, but it wasn't because the neighborhood wasn't safe because people were like, it was like drug dealers were getting robbed. Yeah, you know, like drug dealers killing other drug dealers. You know, there was so much money in the 80s. Like with the crack epidemic, it was just absolutely bananas. We go out to a club, Everybody meet up on the corner on 163rd, and there'd be 40, 50 guys getting ready to go out to the club, and everybody had a G in their pocket, if not more, like everybody made money. Now, the heights, like the corners are dead. Like the game has changed so much, the streets, you know, like everybody's a weed dealer now. You know what I'm saying? Like, like uh, every kid with a backpack is selling weed. Everybody's so cool because they're weed dealers. But back in the days, you know, like not everybody, but some people looked at me like I was a crack dealer because I sold weed, you know. So now you come out and now, oh, shit, you're OG, whatever, you know. It wasn't like that back in the days. I did a successful business in 99 with my brother. We did the marina. The marina is probably the most iconic, like, Dominican spot. You know, it was two Irish brothers that did it, me and my brother. I brought in all the bands from Dominican Republic, Doña Rosario, Sergio Vargas. Uh, I was paying the guy from Aventura. His name is Romeo Santos. Now he's a huge star. I was paying him $3,000 for a show. Now that guy sells out Madison Square Garden seven days a week, in a week. And that was the music I had. And on Sundays, I'd get 1,500, 2,000 people inside and another 1,000 people outside trying to come in. It was a matinee from like 12 to 12. Uh, so we were doing great. So, you know, at that point, once the marina was doing well, I cut off from being on the corners because now I'm trying to transition and then get put under federal investigation and the Joint Task Force with... NYPD and I know I'm under investigation and they fucking lock my brother up as a kingpin. My brother never sold drugs in his life. So my brother was clean. Nobody's ever told me to this day, oh, you know, you didn't know your brother was actually doing, nah. Drunk, high, sniffing, he had a drug problem, he was messed up. In there, going through withdrawal and everything, fighting, you know, a court case for like a year and a half. And they offer you a two to six. Because the feds dropped the case, now it's only the cops. But they invested so much time and energy into it, they couldn't stop, you know? So he pled guilty and did a couple of years. Might have saved his life. He's clean and sober, back with his family. You know, who knows how things could have worked. Maybe I would have got killed if I kept the business. Uh, so at that point, you know, I was still growing. I had houses and they didn't catch it, you know, because I was, I knew what was going on, you know. I graduated from John Jay College right here, School of Criminal Justice, you know. I went to school with cops. You know, I was leaving my spots on the corners to take night classes in law to learn the difference between six pounds and seven pounds. So then I just, I got into my growing and hid from everybody and stayed away from everybody and stayed away from the hood. And you know, lucky I never got caught. I'm very lucky. Like it's so crazy that my brother goes to jail as a kingpin and he ain't never sell drugs in his life. So I always feel like it's because of me it happened to him. You know, the unwanted attention, you know? Before we move on with the content, I want to say a big thank you to Dr. Smoke for supporting this content right here. So if you guys go to drsmoke.com, use my discount code LMC, you're going to get 15% off your entire order. And I highly recommend, you know, you go to Dr. Smoke, order some stuff. They've got high quality stuff. They've got drinks. They've got all different types of goodies, big brands, right? All different types of brands, 3G, all different types of stuff. They've got all the types of candy, right? All super high quality, all tested, all good to go, all legal, delivered to your door. So go to drsmoke.com, use discount code LMC at checkout, get 50% off your order. And also, this is going to help, you know, support this content here. So if you want to support the show, 
Go try it out. Go to drsmoke.com. Use my discount code LMC. You get 50% off your order. Now, let's jump back to the content. Well, Washington Heights was the money capital of New York. You know, that's, that's how hay spread everywhere because all the guys that were coming in to buy their coke and heroin while they're waiting for the money to count, while they're getting a brick or whatever they're doing, now they're waiting around, start smoking weed, take it back. Yo, what is that? Yo, bring back that New York weed. And that's how like Boston, because we're the pipeline. If you come across, I, if you're coming from Florida or Massachusetts, you're coming through I-95 and it's right across that bridge. So for everybody coming from Jersey, Connecticut, anywhere, Washington Heights was the quickest way to the city and the quickest way out. So in Washington Heights, every block was a spot. Coke, heroin, crack, weed, everything. Every single block. It was a, oh, it was crazy. You would drive down the street and there would be four or 500 guys out on the street hustling. It was just out in the open. It was a, it was almost an open market. Every block was like that. My, that block over there was called Vietnam. You know, like certain blocks were worse than others, but that was one of the most legendary blocks. The, from corner to corner, I mean, you know, I can't tell you how much money was being moved there. It was crazy. So that's why the hustlers, you know, everybody that, those 500 guys that are out there selling, they're buying and smoking weed themselves. Plus you got the people from out of state. You have guys doing weed spots doing fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars in a day. And I had three corners in the, the heights. What is the baseline of that? Like and that's what it was. It was just it's it's where all the money was. Well back in ninety I would say ninety one. For Hayes it was generally it was sixty five hundred dollars. So that's why we would go I would go down to Florida and it was four thousand. So you bring it up, you buy a ten pack, that's twenty five thousand. Plus me, I had corners. So I had a corner on my mother's block, 164. Then I was on 173rd in Audubon and 183rd in Audubon. So each spot was generating money and I had partners on different blocks. I had partners with the Arabs and Ed Vic and then 173rd was with Stead and Mikey brothers. And then 183rd was up there with Fruity. So I would go to Florida, pick up the work, drive it up, a white guy driving. You know, with his girlfriend, with a 10, 20 pack in the car, not that suspicious, you know? But being white in the Heights was horrible. I didn't have white privilege in the Heights. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I, I probably had more fights. You know, like my father told me I was different. He was like, so you're gonna get picked on, you know? Either you fight or you don't. You know, pick away, can't do either one. So I did a lot of fighting. My older brother was, had a shorter, hotter temper. Because my father told me, once you let somebody get over on you, they're going to keep on and the word spreads, you know? Like, so if you let one person steal from you, one person rob from you, they're going to come get you. You know, like everybody's going to come. Like I'm willing to fight. Like my father taught me when I was young. It was like, never get into a fight with somebody that's willing to do more to you than you are to them. What are you talking about? Well, you know, you fight this guy. He's willing to pull out a gun and kill you. Are you willing to do that to him? I'm not killing nobody. You know, like, unless they're trying to kill me, I don't have a gun. I've never had a gun. You know, I didn't, never shot nobody. I've had a lot of friends get killed. My best friend got killed when I was 16. There was a contract out on me, him, and another friend of ours, Koa. Um, they finally solved the murder like 20 something years ago. So, you know, I'm 16, I'm just a little kid, you know, and, and he got killed and I saw what happened to his family and, you know, like saw that side of it, you know, like, so for me to want to do that to another person's family, like, it's got to be because I have no choice. So I was lucky that I never had that situation. Yeah, definitely. I've never been robbed. I never went to jail. I got locked up with like a couple of plants once, like misdemeanor, a half a pound another time. But I got, you know, so over 30 years, 33 years, never got locked up, didn't kill anybody, never snitched. 
Uh, still have all those friends that I named, well, Cola instead, and, and my boy Will. Like, there was, there was about 12 guys in the Heights that were killed, you know, by another guy. And he got locked up for it. But everybody that was selling haze, you know, like, most of them aren't around anymore. Well, Hay started for me in 93. Uh, I don't know who was the first person with it. I don't really know of anybody being ahead of me, but I'm sure somebody is because, I mean, I got it from my boy Royce, who I haven't been in touch with in years. And I try to get in touch with him because I want to find out who else did he sell to, you know, so I could find out who else was in that early. So it was 93, by 94, I was going down there. I, I, I'm not sure what year they started doing it down there, but you know, obviously. But it was, I'll tell you the truth, it was like, if it started in 93, by 94, if you had a weak spot, if you didn't have haze, it didn't matter. I like, it just took over, but there wasn't enough. So it was like, whoever could get their hands on that next 10 pack, that next 15 pack, could kill it, you know? So that's what everybody was competing for, to get to Florida, get those get packs, bus. bring it up. Yeah. Back in those days, we'd have summer droughts up here. Well, I know about oh, summer droughts. man. You talking, you know, the numbers went up to 7,500. And, you know, people would be closed down for weeks, months. You know, yeah. like those were great times. Yeah, that's right. And I always kept my money in wheat. And I would say, why did he run out of weed? Why did he just buy more? I didn't understand it. You know, it wasn't around, especially in those summer droughts. So when summers were coming, you know, I kept all my money in weed. And then once you find out that things are slowing down, you start to get those clothes. Hey, what's up? Do you have anything? And you know, this guy's always on, he's out. Oh, I got another call. That's it, no more selling pounds, no more selling ounces, so dimes and 20s. In the summertime, 0 0.3, 0 0.3 was a dime, 0 0.6 would be a 20. Yeah, that was good times. Well, and, and when it first came out, like we called it the stuck. Because, you know, we'd all be chilling in the car, smoking, hanging out, listening to music, talking, joking, and then all of a sudden, everybody just stood quiet. So that's why we called it the stuck. Yo, he's stuck. So the name changed for different people. But I mean, I just thought the smoke was the best, the taste, I, I, I don't know. It was just, everybody felt the same up here. And I know a lot of people don't, have never even tried Hayes. But here in New York, Hayes was, Hayes was king. Like, and then sour came along and you know, slowly sour started to, you know, like come in. So then sour took over. Now there's like 2,000 streams. I think like, you know, if you would have asked me the three most legendary, cause I'm not up on the Skittles and those that's, things. Yeah, that's what you were, that's, yeah, it's like But funny. you know, to me, it was Hayes. It was my boy TK with the, with the OG Kush. And then it was the Sour Diesel. Those were the three. But, but Kush really wasn't effective in the heights. Like yeah. sour and haze. Kush didn't I would really say, make it like it made it in, in California, right? Yes, I would say Kush is much more of that. That's what it's supposed to be. But New Yorkers, at one point, it was just haze for 10 years yeah, until monopoly, sour came. And then yeah. it was, you know, sour slowly crept in and then sour, you know, like got an equal footing, maybe even more for some people. Yeah. But those are the two most New York favorite strains as far as I'm concerned. Why do you think that? The streets told us. Yeah. Because at the time I got haze, I had Northern Lights, or I had Bubblegum, yeah. or I had Afghani. Yeah. And, and I'm selling 10,000 of this and a thousand here. So the streets is telling the you. The market's telling you, the streets are telling you. The streets and telling me, and, and that's bread, what I thought. Bread and spread. You know, a lot of my friends that were doing other type of games, I got them into growing. I was like, dude, I had friends that got 44 years, 20 something years. I'm like, you could sell weed. You know, maybe it's not the same money, but you sleep well. I've slept well my whole life because of what I do. Maybe not the problems I had when I lost the business, 
Well, having the cops, you know, I have no, these guys. It's not like you're selling fed, bro. Like it's like. But I was treated like that. Like yeah, you that, were. That's the you know? part. Of it, yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I got a lot of people out of it, and you know, Dominicans are very crafty, and yeah. you know, like these guys turned apartments and you know they would take an apartment like this and this is 30 lights they'd steal the electric you know like they they trap shit bro that's so the so now not just the haze from florida's coming up there's 100 dominicans growing so now these dominicans aren't doing four lighters dominicans go big so yeah i think at, at some point they got oversaturated, oversaturated with bad haze. Yeah, Guys, not growing because, you know, like a grower, not somebody that's growing weed. This is different. Like my first years, it was a business. Yeah. But when I lost my business and I was broke and I had to borrow money to get back in and couldn't afford because the numbers dropped so much to pay somebody else to sit there, I had to go do it myself. And it's the happiest time I have, other than my daughters and my family, like every day I'm in my garden, you know, I smoke, I chill, you know, you see growth, you know, you become connected. You know, I have friends that have places and they're like, oh, I went by and everything's messed up. I was like, wow, no, the AC, I was like, but in one day, how that, no, that was like five days. So I was like, you haven't been in a place in five days? I go every day. I was in two gardens today. You know? Yeah, you know, but I'm gonna have crazy, to probably uh, stop this soon. Yeah, well, We're coming out. Because, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know how this legal market's gonna happen. Well, they, they make things so complicated. I don't even know if they know what they're doing yet. You know, like, how much is it gonna be? What are the license costs? Who are they gonna let have it? You know, like, and, and everybody I know that's in corporate, like my friend, Joe, mm -hmm. he's running, he's freedom time. He's running his farm. He's doing really good. He's, he's making more money than me, but I'm a lot happier than he is, you know? So do I want to go there? I speak to other legacy guys. I get to go out now and get to meet all these guys and they're not happy, you know, like, so I want to do something for myself. So give me a, a micro license, something small that I can easily handle just by myself. Let me grow my own, sell my own. You can test it, take whatever taxes you want. I'm good, Absolutely. but let me get it. Like I, I think right now, you know, right now in the next like two or three months, I gotta make a decision because I'm about to go back under. You know, like if I don't have the opportunities or anything, now I'm coming out and telling everybody what I'm doing. You know, I gotta worry about the stick up kids now. You know, every interview, everything I do, every picture that exposes me. It is everything the opposite of everything I've done for the last 30 something years. I can't stop. What else am I doing? What else am I gonna do? There's what I'm doing. So either let me in or I'm gonna have to compete with you. And at least in the beginning, I'm better. By the time they get their things together, I hopefully I have you been, Have you been looking to it at all? It's like really what I'm, I think New York is trying to do everything in their power to a certain degree, not to end up like California and they've done a couple of things that are smart to avoid that. But it, I think it sounds great, but I don't really see it. it. It's just like everything else. There was a hardware store every other block in my neighborhood, right? But now you got Home Depot. Let Those hardware stores deep. are gone, right? It's the same thing before you had thousands of families making money. Now it's gonna be a few hundred making everything. So instead, if you give a lot more micro licenses, give all of us legacy, we know who we are. I could point them out. They can point me out. We could filter it out. They should have us figure this shit out. Say who? Give us micro license, give us small licenses, nothing big. I'm willing to pay taxes. I'm willing to do everything to do it right. My plan is clean. I make sure of that. I'm willing, but how much do I need to have political favors involved? Because that ain't gonna happen for me, especially after all these things that go on, you know? So I just don't trust and I'm scared, you know? Like, to trust. 
No, no, now I'm exposing myself. I expose my family. Well, look, 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 look what's happened. You know why, like, our legacy is getting destroyed right now? This is one of the things that happened, right? So now, weed is legal, but they didn't come with a plan to start implementing how they're going to go about this before they decide to decriminalize. So now what you have is all the all these smoke shops, all these smoke shops, like in my neighborhood, that were just for sandwiches and, and sodas yeah, and the crack ones, bags. They're, they're all jugging. They're all they're all selling weed. Nah, they're not weed. They just see, they don't care because if they're not gonna get in trouble, so the guy on the corner is losing his money because the smoke shop that's selling, and that's what's going on. So now. A lot of legacy I know has started quitting, you know, giving up their grows, stopping, or, or just starving because the money on the streets isn't the same because people that weren't in the game are flooding it and flooding it with crap. Y'all better stop smoking shit in those smoke shops uptown. You don't know what's in there. And where is that coming from? It's, it's a, a lot it's of shitty weed from Michigan, I hear. The culture, the fabric, you know, it's just like, Washington Heights is not a Dominican neighborhood like it used to be. Hell's Kitchen is gone. The weed culture guys are being pushed out the market by different chats, different people. You know, that have never been in a game, but exploiting it. And those are the guys that are going to get these licenses and get they the are. money. They, like you, they, you, and that pisses me off. 100%. Let's look five years down the line and see who's on the board of all these companies. Exactly. I'm not going to be surprised if it's some it former politicians but, no, or family. Yeah, so I, I, I can't say that these politicians are not going to do the right thing or don't want to do. But if politics are run by money and the people that are given the most money, are the ones that get the phone calls picked up for, you know? So what happens? They get to twist the story and make them, you know, cause like people say, oh, you gotta be careful about the illegal weed. Everybody's here that I know growers and my weed is a hell of a lot safer than any of that shit you can see out here. Cause these people here, they have passion. You know, like part of me, why I don't want to really get involved with this and not putting my hopes for it. Yeah. Because if I do and actually try to do it and don't, like I would be so pissed at myself for not following my gut. You know, like one of my boys, Frank, both of his brothers were murdered, right? His sons, my one of my friends, his brother will. His sons are still running the avenue on post to this day. Like, I've met these people and told the stories and introduced them. Why aren't they trying to get those kids off the corner? Who's taking more of a loss than those kids? They're still on the corner. Their dad was killed in front of them. Why don't they help them out? I brought them to the political events to show them, not for me, for them. Everybody's talking about, oh, you know, like, we want to uh, uh, reparation, you know, take care of. Who paid worse price than that? I don't see a line at their door. Who deserves a first license before them? Vice and his brother, K.O. were both killed. But anybody that got killed, like family, you lost a father, your brother. Somebody did 20 years, 28 years, you know, like, hell yeah, like all those people, like, like, if I see those types getting it, I'm cool with it. I, I'm good if I never get it, because those people deserve it way more than You know, the plant probably saved my life, because the plant has taken me away from alcohol. I'm a far better person high than I am drunk. I'm a better dad, better husband, better friend. I might be more fun when I drink. I definitely got more fun when I drink. But we, like, you know, you smoke and you just chill. And that's what weed does. It brings, there's, there's no religions here. There's no colors here. Like, what else does that? You know, weed does that. And now they want to screw it up.
what like what if you what would happen if you did get that license? What would you go the best fucking weed oh, yeah. anybody's ever seen? They, my people's already doing it. So I want to thank White Boy Kev for taking the time to do a little interview with me. I think. Um, he really brought a lot of insight, you know, for me to understand, you know, the kind of the history of Washington Heights, New York, you know, a lot of the changes that have happened in the last 30 years. Uh, it's been fascinating stuff to, you know, learn. And, you know, this is an interview I did with him almost, you know, beginning of this year. So it's been a while, you know, since you know, we originally shot this, but big shouts out to the OG. It's definitely a, definitely a legend, definitely a wise, wise dude. And uh, I really appreciate it, you know, spending the time with him. And also, guys, if you guys are looking to, you know, potentially join the team, if you guys have been watching what I've been doing, if you've been, you know, i got a number of different new projects I'm working on, as well as still working on the LMC channel. But if you want to be a part of that, if you want to potentially join the team, I would love for you guys to send a, a resume, an email at prefer. That's the best way probably to get a hold of me ever really is to email, right? And that's, uh, you can email me at highdesignbusiness at gmail.com. Um, you know, so we're looking for editors, researchers i'm doing a whole uh genetics platform i would love you know we're looking for researchers we're looking for like i said video editors uh social media managers um writers and, and a slew of other things business development um, so yeah if you guys are interested at all in, you know potentially to join the team you know helping helping build out this whole movement definitely hit me up uh, we are looking to hire anyways guys please make sure the like button share this comment down below and uh, yeah, follow me on all the social medias if you're not already. Um, and yeah, guys, really appreciate y'all. Anyways, guys, this is LMC. Signing out. We can start whatever. It don't matter. I need a lighter, though. Yeah. It, was a, it was a vision I had 20 years ago to do everything I've already done. And he brought me 20 pounds, and I moved that shit in three days. And then I was like, and it was up from there. Uh, from Harlem, New York, uh, Amsterdam Avenue, to be exact, you know what I'm saying? Grew up with um, my mother and father in the household. For, for um, introduction with weed, my father's from Trinidad, so he was always smoking weed. So the scent of marijuana was basically in my nose since I was born. Yo, that shit, that, my introduction to like the whole, everything happened at a young age, you know, by introduction of my, um, my cousin, who's like my uncle, like an uncle's age, not really a cousin age, but like an uncle age. But at that age, he introduced me to um, Sugar Hill Gang, you know what I'm saying? And that shit changed my life. Like that day in his bedroom, when he was like, yo, I'm, I want you to hear this, this record, and he played me like three records. He played me African Bombada. He played me, it's like 81. He played me African Bombada. He played me um, Sugar Hill Gang, Melly Mel. And I was just like, damn, this shit fire. And breakdancing was a thing. You know what I'm saying? This is, this is like in a historical neighborhood nowadays, like 183rd in, in, in the Bronx, on Grand, um, Grand Avenue over there in Jerome. So it was like, as hip hop evolved, it was like the essence of that shit. You know what I'm saying? And, and going to school in Manhattan and, and in downtown Manhattan, you know, like the Upper West Side, like 70s and shit. I was special because of my knowledge of those records. Like, how do you, they looked at me like I was from the ghetto is ghetto. Like, how do you know that shit? And then I was break dancing and shit from a young age. Listen, this is junior high school shit, man. This is like, yeah, yeah hell yeah. Cause you know, growing up and, and, and being involved with uh, financial transactions, I came to understand a long time ago, years ago, about the economic situation of how we get money and how we keep money and how we spend money, right? Yeah. So someone from New York, right, hustling, I'm not saying a legal job, I'm saying like doing bad shit, right? Say he makes 300000 for the year, right? That shit is actually like only 100000 as opposed to someone who lives down south, right? You know, let's say Georgia, for instance, right, back in the days. It's different now because they have the shopping mall and everything has changed. But back then, they didn't have a Fifth Avenue and all these 
things to, to, to distract their eye to purchasing things. You know what I'm saying? The, down south, the culture is we get money, we buy cars, and we trick on women. That's it. Yeah, because we got the nightclubs, we got dinner, we, we have a whole night like hype. You know, that all evolved. That all, but gets, yeah. that all came about, but New York was always like, this culture, that culture, women here. You see all these beautiful women, you're going to be caught up. You're going to be chasing, you know what I mean? You're going to be chasing tail. <laughs> For real. Oh, who bought the haze to New York? Well, this is, this is my thing, right? I don't know who bought haze to New York. You know what I'm saying? Like, my contribution to the Hayes game, right, is this. Prior to, to, to me coming into the, the Hayes game, that game is, was ran at that time by Dominicans and the Latin community. Like, you, can, you might be Puerto Rican, I don't know, but you might, you know what I mean? You, because you speak Spanish, you have a better shot of getting plugged in with some Hayes or some drugs than if you just black American, especially with drugs. Yeah. Cocaine, cocaine no, was one of the number one things first mm -hmm. because weed, you know, weed was a thing that in the beginning, we, I only used to get from Jamaicans. I get from the Yachty's from 145th, Edgecombe. You know what I'm saying? That's where I was first getting weed. And then I would get weed from Madison Avenue, which was predominantly Jamaicans too. And then the Spanish people had weed too. You know what I'm saying? So we buy some of that shit, the green, you know what I'm saying? And then the haze came along. You know what I mean? We didn't even know, we didn't even, listen, we didn't even, we didn't even give a fuck about what no strain name was. That wasn't even a thing. It, we called it, we named the weed the spot. Like wherever you got the weed from is what we called the weed. So if, if I got some weed from 142nd Street, right? And they had haze, or whatever strain, we wasn't, we wasn't asking what was the name of the weed. We were like, yo, go get that, go get 10 bags of that at 42nd Street, go to 5A, get three of those, go, to, go over here, get two of those, you understand? Like, but we wasn't like, yo, give me the um, OG green bud. Nah, fuck out of here. Give me, the, give me the jar and give me the 20, yo. When niggas came to my block, they'd be like, y'all need the red line. You got the piff? Yeah, I got the piff, nigga. You know what it is? That's it. It wasn't no haze. That's why we came up with the, that's why the name Piff came into, came into, um, into the universe because I wasn't calling it Hude. I wasn't speaking Spanish. I'm black. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? We knew it was haze, but we didn't, Dominicans would be like Pepperhead, Pepperhead, Pepperhead. And we call it Pepperhead. Not knowing that they mispronouncing purple haze. <laughs> nah, real shit. Not even, we don't even care I'll be honest with you. We didn't even care what the fuck that shit was. All we knew is that shit looked like a caterpillar in a bag and a point three something so small would have the whole, four or five of us like this. Like, yo, get it, roll another one. You know what I'm saying? Like, listen, nah, I, I'm going to keep it real. Listen, man, the error, the error that we're talking about is the war on drugs. Listen, man. Being targeted on the war on drugs, you can't imagine what that feels like unless you're targeted, unless you're black or Latino. You dig what I'm saying? You're not, you're not going to understand what that is because you can't imagine what it is to feel, feel like, to like to know that you're targeted, right? And you still got to go outside and get your money, but you know that you're under binocular. And I'm not speaking in, 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 in just like just saying it. I'm speaking it literally. I'm not saying figuratively. I'm saying literally. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, it was dangerous times. Yeah. It was dangerous times and we had to adjust. We was already risking our lives selling hard drugs. Most of the people in the time when we transitioned in 2000, even the Dominicans, were straying away from hard drugs from going to prison. Because yeah. everyone wanted to be outside. Nobody wanted to go to jail forever. And we all was in the 90s doing mad shit and we all caught felonies. So it's like, what are we gonna do, catch another felony? Go away forever. Shit is looking too good out here right now. Hold up, what's the other alternatives? Oh, weed, exotic? You know, because guess what? Sell, weed is not evil, but going to jail is because now you're in jail dealing with all other types of shit. You know, you're in jail with people who didn't kill people and people who didn't did all types of shit and you're in there sitting in there yeah. for some weed. It's, it's crazy, it's like, 70, it's like 72% of everyone is all non-violent non drug offenders, so. So like back in the days, 
you know, shit was getting hot and one of my peoples had caught a case and I was like, I had got a federal lawyer to just like not have any involvement with that shit. Like, I, you know what I mean? And when I seen, when I met up with my fed lawyer, I didn't have no fed case. I just was protecting myself and got a federal lawyer because these niggas had some fed case. And I'm like, nope, I'm already on the right path. I'm doing other shit. I'm not even involved with that. And I really wasn't. That was no cap. I really had made a, like a dedication to myself that I wasn't going to be involved with anything that was going to put me in a big house. What I mean by that was like even fraternizing. My, fratr my fraternizing, I, I deaded that too. I deaded everything and then walked a whole nother path of cannabis, you know? Because I, I made an oath to myself, like, I'm just going to fuck with weed. That's it. If I'm going to do anything, it's just going to be that. Because I, I, I really fuck with weed. I really love it. Like, I really had a passion for it. I used to read the weed cannabis Bibles. Yeah. I used to be fucking with the growers upstate New York. This isn't to be, this is from day one. Day one from 1990, I was involved with the growers. I was up in Ithaca, New York, you know, trading growers coke for weed. Really? They all were getting high. So I'd take all their weed, trade them coke. You know what I'm saying? An ounce of coke was 2,500 back then. So I'm getting like, you know what I mean? A pound of weed for an ounce of coke. <laughs> ounce of coke was like $500. <laughs> So I get a pound for 500. <laughs> yeah. You feel me? So my, my, my perspectives on weed had changed from a young age. So by the time I got to New York, you know, and I was looking, I was dissecting the weed. I'm like, yo, only way I would buy weed from someone in New York is if it looked more fire than some shit from upstate. Back then it was fire because it was exotic. I, it was kind bud and all this other shit that we were smoking chocolate brown weed in New York. We were smoking regs with Guinness stout on it and shit like that. Like, that's what we were smoking in New York. You dig? And, it, and then the weed from upstate was really considered exotic in New York. It was like, oh, you go to the spot, I'm like, yo, look at this shit they got, bubble gum and all this. I smoking bubble gum in 9-3. So I'm gonna make, I'm gonna, I'm gonna speed this story up. So check it out, right? So in 2000, you know what I mean? I started dabbling with the haze, right? And I was making a, you know what I mean? I was moving a little bit of haze, a little bit. And then I figured it out. My man was like, yo, he was like, yo, why, why don't you be like, you know, rich port of Harlem with the haze? I'm like, what? He was like, you fuck with that? I'm like, hell yeah. And he brought me 20 pounds and I moved that shit in three days. And then I was like, and it was up from there. And then yeah, that was some weird noises right there. <laughs> <laughs> that shit threw me off. I'm ready right now. Like. <laughs> Yo, what's up, G? Yo, you got the plug? You pick up? Yeah. Yeah, I did. Can we, can we see it? Yeah. Um... I don't know, man. This is getting pretty out of hand, bro. This is pretty... Fuck, dude. There's roaches in there. I know, dude. I know. What are we gonna do? Bro, I don't know. What? Have you heard of LMC? What are you talking about? Dr. Smoke. Shout out to our homies over at Dr. Smoke. If you guys go to drsmoke.com, use my code LMC, you're gonna get 15% off your time. Okay, what what is it? Let's go, let's go. Yeah. Man, fuck fuck this bro. We're not I'm not trying yeah, to buy from Randy anymore. Right. Randy's got that booth. Fuck Randy. That's he got. Fuck that shit, bro. What are we looking at? These are crazy, look at that. I'm gonna order some right now. Look at that. That's sweet heat platinum THCA flower for what? Damn. And the thing, bro, I got I literally got a quarter from from Randy. Shit's looking like ass, looking like some butt butt. And we could have just been doing this the whole time. They've got cookies. They've got different products from all over the country. Putting in our address. All right, let's do it. And then, right. let's, and then make sure, let's use LMC 15 right now. Wait, what was that again? LMC 15. LMC 15. We're gonna get 15% off, it looks like. Oh, that makes it even better deals. Let's go. All right. What, we got the one and a half gram On diamond infused pre-roll. For seven dollars. Five? No, but it's got the but the discount on. You're it. right. Holy shit. Five. Man, what? they got disposables. They got edibles. That's crazy. 
We've got hundreds of, they've got hundreds of products looks like. And really what Randy had literally, Randy had that boof pack, that butt butt, and it was only, that's all he had. We're never gonna talk to yeah, Randy Yeah, fuck again. Randy, bro. Blocking fuck Randy that right shit. now. And shout out to Dr. Smoke. Block. Hey guys, really appreciate you guys for supporting me, for watching the content. I hope you guys enjoy it. Um, and like I said, you know, throughout the last you know year pretty much, this Dr. Smoke has been one of the absolute main reasons why we've been able to up the production quality, up the amount of videos, you know, be able to actually bring people on the team. And you know, by going over to drsmoke.com using my discount code LMC15, you're gonna get 50% off your entire order. But really, it helps, you know, one, you're getting some quality products, you know, and two, you're gonna be help supporting the channel. But really appreciate you all. Thanks again for rocking with me. Big shouts out to Dr. Smoke. Now let's jump back into the content. I was like, because I already sold a lot of drugs in my time. So me doing business management with the drugs, I was already super knee deep in the game. I don't know what I mean? I done been to jails a bunch of times. You know what I mean? I done beat cases. I done had old, young working for me. I done been out of town everywhere with real niggas. You know what I'm saying? So it was easy for me. I was like, oh, this is easy. Like, this is, this is walk in the park. And I can market this shit to every, it was so crazy. I'd be on my block going like this, like smoke, smoke, smoke. smoke. I'll do it to the detective, to the D's. Just because I'm so habitually going smoke, smoke to cars passing by that it be, may be an undercover and I'll just automatically turn around and be like, smoke, oh shit. <laughs> or I'll be in the store and I'll be like, smoke, smoke, smoke. And then and, 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 and be like, oh, what did you say? I'll be like, you heard what I said? He said, show me his badge. I'll be like, I ain't say I had it on me. The fuck is you talking about? It was just like that. It was just like, I don't care if I go to jail for weed. I'm getting out tomorrow. And you know, my Fed lawyer told me, this is what he told me. He said, yo, check this out. How much weed do you move? I'm like, ah, 20 pounds. He was like, keep that shit under 100 pounds in your possession and 20,000 to the side and you'll never see jail. I was like, what? That's crazy. He shook my hand, he commended me, and I just kept that vibe going. You know what I'm saying? And I pushed it to the limit on a lot of things. I got into music. I met up with the diplomats, you know what I'm saying? So my, my introduction with the diplomats was, basically I had the weed, right? And I was really feeling myself because I, I felt like I was gifted the weed through spirits or some other shit or some whole next level shit of, I kind of manifested my relationship with them. I was like, I bet you if I, you know what I mean? I bet you if I introduce this weed to them, I bet you I'll be in a rap game type shit. Cause I didn't even fuck with the music industry like that. I didn't, I wasn't a part of that. I would just want some like knee deep in the street game, hard body, right? So I seen Joel's, I gave him some weed. He's on 145th street with um, Jim Jones and Luca Brazzi. That's who he was up there with. Gave him some weed. A week later, I seen him again. He was with Jim again. They was like, yo, there he go right there. They was like, yo, what's up? I was like, yo, what's up? Come to the crib. They came to the crib, and I ain't gonna lie, that day, I, I remember that shit like it was yesterday, and that shit was like 20, 22 years ago. I was like, Jim came in my crib, he looked around, he seen all these cases of Cristal and Don Perignon and all this weed and guns, and he was just like, yo, where you been at? I was like, I've been, I've been on the line, I mean, get money, been getting to it. He was like, I don't, this is my first time meeting him though. He already, they already had their ex a run, but this is like right before they're Diplomats. Not, not. This is before Diplomats. Yeah. This is like them negotiating the deal for Rockefeller, right? Two days later, he brought Cam through, I met Cam. And it was like, I ain't gonna lie, like with Cam, Jim and Joel's, it was like, like an instant brotherhood shit. Like, we were just like on some like, damn. Niggas got the missing links to whatever we're doing, whatever agendas we got going on, we, we all brought something to the agenda that we had. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm like, I'm a street nigga, but I got too much shit going on that rappers love. Everybody wants this. Everybody wants all the flyers gear, all the best weed. You know what I'm saying? Girls coming through every day. You know what I'm saying? Jewelry, rollies. Like, I'm living, I was living that life hard, like, you know what I'm saying? So it was like, wait a minute, he, you down with us, like, wait a minute. 
But when I, when I met them, I'm not going to lie, it was like instant, like, weed shit. It was like we was on this weed shit. You know, they had, you know, they was doing diplomats. Yeah. I'm like, how am I going to fit into this? Because at first I used to be standoffish. Like, I'm not going to no events with y'all. Y'all do y'all business. When y'all see me, we hang out. Yeah. It's all good. But I'm not really trying to be in y'all business like that. I'm not one of them want to be down ass niggas. I'm, I'm a person who has always been comfortable with my creations and what I do. And I get money. I get money doing that. I know how to monetize my shit. I've been doing that. Like I said, we all, we all filled in missing links for each other. Where they're like, damn, he has the street cred on some drug shit. He got the bud. So we got the bud. So guess what? When, when they met me, yeah, I'm special with the weed. But guess what? Now, the whole diplomats, anyone affiliated with us, is empowered with the bud too, though. You feel me, though? Absolutely. So, like, all right, so I got the weed, right? And I'm the nigga. You ain't empowered. I got all the pounds. But guess what? You right next to me. You my man. You're, you're introducing a whole other market that I don't even fuck with to cannabis, to the same shit I got. You're even using my name. Like, yeah, this is that shit Shice be having. That he's, you know what I mean? This is that Shice. Yeah. Shout outs to Cam. Shout outs to Jim. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Shout outs to Jewels too, because. So with me, it was like, when I started with the weed, I also got into music also, because it opened up a door. You dig what I'm saying? Yeah. Whereas like, I looked at Diplomats like some Wu-Tang shit. That's how I looked at it from all the way back then. I looked at it like, damn, everybody's going to eat off this shit if niggas, if niggas play it right. You know what I'm saying? The, 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 the lowliest person could get money off this shit because this is a movement. And I love I loved the fact that I, I love the fact that, you know what I'm saying, Dame Dash was involved. You know what I'm saying? I, I love the fact that it was some black empowerment yeah. shit. You know what I'm saying? And, and we was really creating shit and executing, even if it wasn't polished. But, it, it, but, you know, they weren't a major label. Sometimes people be like, oh, they don't look polished. The, the set don't look polished. They, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's like, yo, chill, man. Like, we doing this our way. Yeah, it's authentic. Though. Authentic. Yeah, yeah. We but, created it. Yeah. I was just the gatekeeper of, you were one of, the, of major, the bud. Yeah, you were the thing that brought in the And the swag of organizing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, kind of being like, because Cam was loving it. He was like, he couldn't believe that a nigga was, like, moving it like that. Like, yo, you really doing all this shit with the weed shit? And, you know, we was all one team. So guess what? I knew that if I could bait Cam to fuck with the purple, because he was on his pink shit. Yeah, right. I was like, if I could get him off that, I'm a win. Because yeah. everybody knows that needs to know that this is my flow, the, the purple shit. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? So that proved that, you know, when, when you, it's like you get money, so it, it attracts money. People see you with shit, they're like, damn, I got to go fuck with him because he know how to get it. I got to be next to him. What I was doing on, was straight marketing. I'm not going to hold you. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? When I started Purple City and I was coming up with these purple names and starting this whole wave, it's just because of the name and marketing. The weed was never purple, bro. 100%. And I think you, Loki, if I, if I really have to think about it, I think you are the precursor to the Runs crew. I think about it. I didn't even think about it. Shout out to them, but yes. You know, without, with, without, it's funny without, you said that because when I first started seeing Runs, you know, at first it was rainbow colored, and then it changed to um, this purple theme. And I was like, what the fuck is going on? Who, wait a minute. They're not even from over here. Who's? But the internet, it was the internet that was giving eyeballs onto everything and giving visibility to people emulating things or showing their influence, the things that they were influenced by. You dig what I'm saying? It wasn't like they was copying. It was just that the influence on what we was doing was so heavy that it made it this other new thing. It, 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 guess what? If we had the internet, we might not even been who we are because it might have been somebody else getting the light. You know what I'm saying? So things played out exactly how they were supposed to play out. I don't have any regrets. You know what I'm saying? When it comes to, to the haze and shit like that, the Dominicans was bringing that shit over here. I just marketed the shit out of it and took ownership of it from a, from a black American standpoint living in Harlem. You dig what I'm saying? Look what's happening now in cannabis. It's like diplomats, I'm going to keep it real. Like when it comes to diplomats and, you know, everything that comes with it from the, from Brazi to Cam to Jim, Jewels, you know, I don't, I'm not here to, to build a case or nothing like that. You know what I'm saying? But at the end of the day, offspring of, of diplomats, we run the cannabis shit. Like we, 
we are the cannabis of the world on some dead serious shit because with our influence, with me being a gatekeeper of the weed and then the music influence and then all the street influence that we all brought to the table, every one of us, because look, Purple City, Uncasa, Aguilar, they were pumping up that shit heavy everywhere they went. It was Purple City. We got the haze. We got the piff. Brazi, he got the piff. Jim Jones, he got the piff. Jewels, he got the piff. When it switched to sour, we all had the sour. The Diplomat family, even Max B at the time, that whole sour way, that's our shit. Straight up, bro. Like, no, no bullshit. I don't give a fuck what it is, who it is. We started the influence on being trappers with Bud. I'm sorry. I don't, I don't, I'm not trying to step on nobody's toes or, you know, disrespect anybody's shit. But the piff came from our family. The, dour wave, the sour wave came from our family, man. Not saying that it wasn't sour out there and people weren't smoking sour and there's not legends in the game, AJ Sour. We're not discrediting that. We're not saying we invented anything, but we took it to that next level of notoriety of being like, this is the shit. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, listen, the word piff was ultimately supposed to be for the culture okay it was a donated word man it was a donated word i came up with the word for cannabis it was already prior previously there but it was for everything it was like a different word for like drip or swag or some shit like that you dig what i'm saying i designated that for our whole family to be like nah this is it's just if it's just this yeah because it, it coming from puerto rico then coming from miami then being grown in New York is just an evolution of names. You know what I mean? That's it. LCG, what is, what is Lemon Cherry Gelato? That's just some runs. Right? I mean, whatever works, man. It's cannabis, yeah. man. We grew, up, we grew up smoking rags. Bro, bro, I was literally in like a grow the other day, and they were like literally 80% of what we have to, we're forced to grow LCG. Yo, back then, if you grew weed and it was good, it was good. Yeah. That's it. It's it was all, no all like, all oh, that's there, boof. That, yo. We'll be like, that's rabbit food. Because there was some, some regs that were just like so bad that you'd be like, that shit don't get you high. Yeah. And don't forget the, uh, the, uh, the, um, the evolution of Smokers Club. That, you know, that happened after I did- 13 years ago. Yeah, 13, 13 years ago. Which is 10 years, basically 10 years after I'm doing music and I'm doing this whole Purple City shit. We're doing music, we're doing all these mixtape covers, cartoons, or some weed shit. You dig what I'm saying? independently in stores, setting the tone of being like, you don't have to be in the majors to make this money. You could be an independent, and instead of doing, going platinum, selling a million records, and getting a million dollars, a dollar record, you can go independent, do 100,000 records, get $7 a record, and make 700,000. You dig what I'm saying? Yeah. To where, to where my, my, major, my major record label counterparts are like, what, we're going to Koch Records. We're leaving the majors. We're going over here where, where you're at. And, and like, what? Right, wait a minute, what? Hold up. Stay over there. I want to go over there. Why would you want to come over here? At the end of the day, niggas is on Koch after that. You dig what I'm saying? And I'm looking like, but where's my deal? <laughs> you know? And I ended up on Koch anyway. As soon as I met motherfuckers, we was like going to shows. I would get the t-shirts printed up. You know what I'm saying? They'll bring in my contribution because I'm not just going to be around on some leech and shit, especially if I want to be, be a part of this shit. You dig what I'm saying? So I'm getting T-shirts printed. We, you know what I mean? Jim really put me on. He was like, yo, look, we about to go on tour. You coming on tour. This is how we're going to get money on tour. We're going to hustle. You an excellent hustler. You know what I'm saying? So we go on tour and we hustle on tour. In each city. Each city. The, the ill shit is that, you know, Luca Brasi had the whole um, CD shit, right? That's just a hustle in New York, though, selling CDs back then. Everybody sold CDs. He just had the knack for selling a $3 CD for $20. Because niggas would come shopping and shit and spending all this money. And they'd be like, what? You're not going to support my brand? <laughs> you're up here buying all this expensive clothes and you're not going to support my brand? Buy CD. <laughs> Motherfucker be like, how much? Think like 20. Think like that shit $3. So what? This is my shit. All right, man. 
Here's a 20, man. Let me get the CD. Man. It was impressive. I'm not going to lie. Yeah, it, a, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, it was, it, and nobody was safe. I don't care who you were. The president of the United States would walk up, and they're going to run down on you and be like, $20, Mr. President. <laughs> we, we wasn't no CD sellers, but we took that whole play on the road, and you know, we sold everything. We sold clothes. We sold CDs. I definitely sold weed. See, I sold a lot of weed on, on the road. Yo, it, back in the days, when I started fucking with Dipset, there was an article in the Source magazine, right, about crews, hip-hop crews, right? And it, and it had the outline. These are the main rappers. This is this person. This is this person. And this person is the weed guy. I was like, oh, shit. I'm the weed guy in this picture. But that was my role. I know, but my role was so crazy as the weed man, I had a record label off of it. Purple City. No, seriously, think about this shit, bro. Yeah. People overlook this shit. They over, they try to, you know what I mean, undermine my shit. But it's like, I created a whole record label. I wasn't a, I'm from Harlem, where you have to, you have to go in front of the board of committees to be deemed a person who's hot as a rapper. I didn't go in front of no board or no committee to be deemed hot as a rapper. I was already hot. Fuck a rap, nigga. I was, I was popping. I already had the whole wave, everything. You dig what I'm saying? But we've done everything, man. We started Smokers Club. Smokers Club came about because Johnny Shipes, Smoke Dizza, who, you know, in our careers of doing music, Johnny's been with me for 20 years. Dizza's has been with him for a little longer than that. I was the weed stamp. You dig what I'm saying? Music. I brought them in with the music. As far as me doing Purple City, Johnny came in on some associate producer level. You dig what I'm saying? Um, Dizza came in on the, the new artist that I was giving development to. And they came up with the idea of doing like festivals and shit like that. You know what I'm saying? Like the Smokers Club. I was like, word, that's what we're doing now? I was like, that's good. I actually like that better than doing this fucking record label shit. This shit is whack. I'm just going to, all right, check this out. I'm just going to focus on the weed again. I'm not, fuck this music shit. It's over. I did my last album, the IBD, International Bud Dealer, which I dropped in 2009. That was my, a solo album that I did in stores through Baby Grand Records. I put out five albums with them. And we started Smokers Club. And I was just like, yo, instead of me, you know, breaking artists on records, I'm just going to be the host and co-sign all these artists. And it's like our universe. Yeah, yeah, like we put Burn on his first Which tour. so ahead of his time, too, if you think about we, it. Listen, yeah. we put Burn on his first tour. Real shit. Yeah. You know, Currency, shout outs to Currency, Godfather. Wafers that are going out hosting that uh, so, brand activation. So shout outs to Wafers. I've been working with them for like... The last year, basically, you know, when they go to Rolling Loud, I'm like the brand ambassador for their gifting suite at, at Rolling Loud. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was previously doing that for Packwoods, you know what I'm saying, as the official sponsor for cannabis sponsor for Rolling Loud. Yeah. So I represent the official sponsors for cannabis for Rolling Loud, basically. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And gifting artists packaging and branding, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and keep it authentic, because guess what, man? You can, anyone can just give away weed, but it's different when you're getting it from someone who's in cannabis, who knows about the shit. The reason why we respect, like, you feel me? Yeah. And now I got the podcast. So with the podcast, podcast yeah. that's like my new tool of basically giving back to the culture. You know what I'm saying? Which is interviewing people who I feel are people in the space who need a voice, who need more you know, activation from someone who's in cannabis who people look at, may look at me like, oh, Shice thinks he's all that. Shice thinks that he started this. I don't think none of that shit. I just have a long history in it, and I've, my work supersedes any questions about what I've done or who I am. And my backstory and my mentality has always been the same. I haven't changed. I haven't had to reinvent myself. That, that's why my... my me and music didn't really hit off because I was Shice Bubs before met rap. So me going into character was kind of, it was you're, like, you're an actor, bro, when you, become, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It was like, it's like, is Shice Bubs acting? Is, who is this guy? And people are just getting to know me for the first time because I have this whole new platform of visibility yeah. that they don't know the real me. 
they're just like, oh, this is some guy who just thinks that it's all this. And it's like, listen, man, I'm, 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 very, I'm very well in tune with my lifestyle and what it's created. Because it, it was a vision I had 20 years ago to do everything I've already done. It was, nothing was by chance. Nothing was by luck. I didn't luck up not one time. I didn't get nothing. I didn't get anything lucky. You know what lucky is? When I go in my coat pocket in my closet and I look in the inside pocket and I find 5K or I find 10K, that's lucky. That's the only luck I get. I don't, I don't get luck. I, everything is premeditated with me, yo. You know what I'm saying? I'm a businessman. I, I'm a businessman at the end of the day. So it comes with having a good business plan and a blueprint for what you want to do. You dig? Yeah. And, and, and keeping your name clean. Even when people try to tarnish your shit. You dig? But, you know, like we're a community of operators that have been under this war on drugs. We're survivors. We, you know what I mean? We've helped each other. We've done certain things, whatever. Now's the chance. You know what I'm saying? We're not just up against state regs. We're up against federal regs. You dig? We're up against federal regs, and unless you're tied in nationwide, you might get, you know what I'm saying? Absolutely. I'll tell you this. One thing is that wisdom and knowledge are two different things. Know the difference, okay? Um, consistency is something that's key, and dedication is the third. You know what I'm saying? And that's it. And that goes for anything in life, man. It's not about what you do, but it's how it's done. You dig what I'm saying? So you have those three things. You have some wisdom and you have some knowledge and some wisdom. Wisdom comes with time. Knowledge is just thinking you know shit, but you don't really know anything because you haven't had the, the wisdom of longevity of being like, this is what it is. You know what I'm saying? Big shouts out to the mayor, Shice Bubs, absolute legend. It was super dope to sit down with him and just like, you know, learn from him. Um, he really put it together for me, um, you know, and really explained the timeline of hip hop, you know, the, the, the drug laws in New York at the time, you know, you know, how that has, how that like interloops with, you know, the different sentencing laws, you know, how that a lot of people switched over to weed because it was a lot less costly and a lot less time in prison potentially, um, if any. And yeah, it was just absolute, you know, absolutely amazing to talk to Chice Bubs. You know, such a wealth of knowledge. This we did this interview almost like shit, like a year plus ago. So this is finally coming out now. But um, like I said, man, such a legend. I can't, I can't thank him enough. Uh, I salute you. Everything you've been doing, Chice, like it's it's really impressive, bro. And uh, you really have built a, an amazing legacy. And um, yeah, thank you again, brother. It was it was amazing amazing to talk to you, and I, I hope we can do this again. And shout out to everyone in New York, though. New York, absolutely one of my favorite cities, one of my favorite markets. Jersey, shout out, you know, the East Coast. And yeah, so much rich culture in this episode. Really enjoyed it. If you guys enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, share this comment down below. Also, make sure to join our High Design streaming platform. Just go to www.highdesign.media. You're going to get early access to, to content like this. Like this, you already got early access if you were a member. You're also going to be, be able to join our, our community. We're going to do you know exclusive live streams there as well. And man, this one was a treat. So if you guys enjoyed though, let me know down in the comments. We'd love to hear from you guys. Anyways, this is LMC signing out. You just got to change with the times or perish with them. Because you said how to uh, evolve. How, do, how does Luca Brasi always stay relevant? I change with the times, so I don't perish with him. I always reinvent myself. I went from K. Lucci to K. Luch, to Luch, to Luca, to Gooch, to Luca Brasi, to Zilla. LNS Collection. Whatever I touch, it turns diamond. You know, God gave me a gift. You know, I think my gift was to really help other people in their lives. Cause I ain't get this life. All I did was help these moths that blew up and forgot about me. And promised me shit. Oh, yo, I'ma get you a house, I'ma get you a car, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm here. And give me shit. It's for my vlog. Fuck you, talk about. Stop. No, bro. He's already set the trend, right?
He's already shut the fucking trend, bro. Stop, stop playing with me. Big gumbo's in the building. I set the trends. Bop! Remix. I've always had a head on my shoulders. I always had it figured out how to make a dollar. My grandmother, she was from Grand Projects. May Allah be pleased with her. She showed me how to sell a soda pop for a dollar and I paid a quarter for it from the market. I ain't never looked back. I had the house of spirit in me after that. That was it. I went and got a shopper car full of soda pops and sold them a thousand dollars. This was um, Harlem week, the Jazz Mobile. You know, late, uh, uh, early 80s, late 90s, you know. They, like, man, it's just a beautiful thing, man. Harlem Renaissance, you know? We outside! We outside! I ain't got no prop money, neither. Oh, good man. Hold on. Oh, what? How you doing, bro? I love you. How you feel? Can I get a back? There are three capitals of the United States. Los Angeles is the capital of entertainment and media. Washington, D.C. is the political capital, and well, New York is viewed as the financial capital of the United States. The Big Apple is really the epitome, or the epicenter, of America's obsession with making money and living the once vibrant idea and that of the American dream. While there are hustlers and entrepreneurs all around the country and all around the world, it can't be denied that New York City has been one of the major breeding grounds for some of the most successful hustlers in the world. And when it comes to this plant and its legalization, there hasn't been an exception. Luca Brasi, otherwise known as Kareem Butler, grew up in the Bronx and hustled his way to where he is now. In this High Design QP episode, we're going to cover the rise of the gumbo brands and the people behind it, and that of Kareem Butler and his partner, Alex Major, while also discussing the recent announcement that the CEO of the cookies brand, Burner, has now entered into a, a partnership with the gumbo brand. We're gonna discuss that and the implications that the recently announced deal has on this new emerging market. Please make sure to hit the like button, share this, subscribe with the notifications turned on, and follow me on all the social medias. The links are down below in the description. Anyways, welcome to this QP. This is LMC. Let's run it. Luca Brazi, otherwise known as Kareem Butler, grew up in the Bronx. His mom worked hard to have money to send him to private school, but Luca was really just focused on trying to stack bread. Luca, as a kid, had a love for hustling, working hard and also acquiring top shelf flowers. As a kid, he was always trying to get into the famous NYC spot ran by Branson. And every time Branson would tell little Luca, he couldn't come in. And by the way, if you haven't seen the high design history episode I did on Branson, I highly recommend you go watch that. But it's pretty wild to see that the same young boy that tried to cop from Branson is now a co-partner of his, given that they both have partnerships with Burner and the Cookies brand. But more on that later. Around the year 2000, Luca would move over to Harlem and start hustling with a cousin of his on 145th and Broadway, where he'd be selling CDs, knockoff designer coats, and other products as well. During this time, he would actually be making a lot of good money. And a little later on, during this time in Harlem, he would link up with up-and-coming rappers at the time, Cameron and Jim Jones, who had just started to form the now world-famous rap group Dipset, otherwise known as The Diplomats. Over the course of a couple years, Luca would help Dipset in so many different ways, acting as the muscle for the set, while also providing promotion, as well as recruiting new up-and-coming rappers to join the group. See, Luca was known as someone who could really help the up-and-coming rappers from that area because in a lot of ways he had a lock on that 145th spot i mean check out this clip where he talks about it i got paid very well through cameron remember i found the jr writer hellrail on casa shice ball we can go on and on and on aguilar you know i brought these people to influence to life they were already who they were but i was already lit remember i was hot every rapper Anybody that was everybody came to 145th and checked in with me. I was like the fucking man. Like the hood celebrity. You come through, you check in with Luca Brazi. Yo, Gooch, yo, we're going to see Gooch. I got Scarface, Lil Wayne, Juvenile. I had tour buses. Jay-Z and Beyonce come up there and kick it with me. The whole conversation, 20,000 people just run up and crazy shit, bro. Real history. 
Around the mid 2000s to early 2000s, Luca would start talking with rapper Shice Bubs, who today now is the owner and partner with Burner in the clothing and accessories brand, The Smokers Club. But in the early to mid 2000s, Shice Bubs and Luca would work together and they actually helped build the Dipset subsidiary, Purple City Bird Gang. Now, what's really interesting about this time is that Shice Bubs and Luca worked hand in hand to be one of the first people to really bring the purple haze to New York City. Gulf Street Nucleus era, where Red Man used to go buy a hundred bags. They were, not, they were one of the first people to bring purple haze to New York City uh, via Miami, from the way of Miami. And uh, they called it Crippy back then. So I introduced the world to uh, Purple Haze, Cameron Days, Dipset, uh, uh, Purple Haze, and uh, here I am now with Gumbo. Now, during this time, Luca and Shice Bubs were talking about doing a collab album. Unfortunately, right when they were about to do the collab, Luca would end up getting arrested and had to do a bid for a little bit of time. And when he got out, Shice Bubs and the other members of Purple City signed a deal with Baby Grand Records, and Luca would get none of the money, which then in turn caused some conflict. While it seems that there has been there was some beef there, it looks like they have patched things up, and that is just a thing of the past. I think it's super dope to see how far Shice Bubs and Luca have come, with Shice reaching massive success with his podcast Heavy Smoke, as well as the success of the Smokers Club, and then now with Luca having so much success now with Gumbo and the Flytrap brand. Now when Luca got out of prison, he promised himself that he was going to hustle and make money only from mostly legal endeavors. So he turned to fashion, selling custom fur coats to some of the biggest celebrities and rappers at the time, including 50 Cent, Chris Brown, French Montana, and many more. Luca had a partner in this fur coat business who unfortunately ended up getting locked up in because of a situation involving some stolen coats, and we'll just leave it at that. Now, in 2017, Luca would meet his future wife and now business partner, Alex Major. Alex, just like Luca, is a real deal hustler coming from New London, Connecticut. She started working at Def Jam Marketing at only the age of 18, working under Deidre Graham and Julie Greenwald, which for those who aren't as tapped into the music business, well, those are very, very well-renowned music execs. Alex's adopted brother happens to be Jordan Reed, who played in the NFL and was a multiple-time pro bowler. And Alex has been working since she was 12 years old and also looked after Jordan and many of her cousins. So as we can see, Alex Major was very determined and driven at a young age. In 2017, Alex and Luca would meet and start dating, which would mark the start of a power couple that together would start to climb their way up the game. Now, in around the mid to late 2019, early 2020, Luca's friend Bully Brown would introduce him to a West Coast cat by the name of Young LB. By the way, if you haven't watched the high design episode I did on Runts and Young LB, I highly recommend you go watch that. Seriously, it will give you a lot more context to the story we're about to talk about right now. So definitely go check that out. So it seems that Young LB has done his research and realized who Luca was and his history. Luca would start to give LB a tour of the different hoods in New York. And during that tour, LB would start to see how tapped in Luca was with the community. And Young LB told Luca that he should buy a stamp from him and jug his own jokes up flavor slash brand. And given Luca's entrepreneurial instincts, bells started to ring in his head and he realized this would be a great new endeavor to jump into. Now, there's a lot of power in the idea of what we as humans call exotic, right? Exotic is defined as something originating in or a characteristics of a distant, potentially foreign region. See, just like what Branson did back in the 80s and 90s with obtaining flavors and flowers from the West Coast, LB meeting Luca was in fact the same principle. Luca now had not only exotic flavors, but also more importantly, he now had a stamp from at the time, the most sought after and up and coming entrepreneur in this emerging industry, at least in terms of the national street recognition. See, in 2019, Runtz and the public leader of the Runtz movement and that of young LB was at the time at an all-time high in popularity and demand. In 2020, Leafly would award Runtz the Flavor of the Year award, as well as Cookies and Burner would invest in the Runtz brand. So the timing of Luca meeting LB and him getting a Jokes Up stamp was nearly almost perfect. 
Now, Luca has obviously been involved with this plant for many years, but I think really what happened with the rise of the gumbo flavor in brands is a combination between Young LB giving Luca the blueprint slash instructions initially to roll out the brand slash flavor, combined with Luca's insane hustle. But also, I think one of the very critical components to this massive rise in success is Luca's network and ties to many of the top dogs in music and other businesses in New York. Many of the legendary rappers we know today, well, he had close ties to, given his days with Dipset, as well as the fact that his partner, Alex, worked at one of the most famous record labels of all time in that of Def Jam. So it's really safe to say that, yeah, the Gumbo family, otherwise known as Luca and Alex, are extremely well connected. So now because Luca now had the credibility with NLB's Jokes Up stamp and the newly formed Gumbo flavor slash brand, he was able to utilize all of the connections he has in New York and beyond. The famous rap podcast, Drink Champs, hosted by the legendary rapper N-O-R-E or Noriega and DJ EFN, is a great example of how a platform combined with a credible brand slash product can shoot your business up to the top in record speed. When analyzing Luca's Instagram, we see countless pictures of him and famous rappers, but the most recurring is without a doubt him and Noriega. And it seems to me that Drink Champs and Nori are extremely supportive and loyal to the Gumbo brands. Luca and Alex are at many of the shows given that Drink Champs has a kind of a live audience that really just consists of all of their close friends to the show. But this, my friends, is why podcasts are one of the most efficient ways to network with people. See, with a podcast, you're not only getting content, but it's also a mechanism to spend time and network with the guests that you have on your show. So it's a two birds, one stone type of thing. And with Luca and Alex being at the shows all the time, well, it only just helps add to their already impressive and vast network of famous individuals. Like for example, Kevin Hart or Dave Chappelle. And really once you build those relationships, well, potentially that could le lead to full on partnerships with said famous individuals. See what Luca must have realized pretty early on when working with Young LB is that he could just observe and learn what Young LB was doing and then start doing it himself. See, imagine if you combine the strategies utilized by Burner and Young LB. And to clarify for those who don't get where I'm heading with this, with Burner, he has a partnership sub-brand model with different celebrities, whereas Young LB has done partnerships like partnership sub-brands with regular people all over the country, which really where the term stamp in this context comes from. Both approaches have been extremely effective, and if I had to guess, the stamp approach pioneered by Young LB, Jay Pate, and others from the Jokes Up Runts crew most likely is a bigger moneymaker in the short term, whereas the celebrity collaborative brands are more of a slow burn, and really the ROI in that really is less guaranteed. Because a celebrity partnership is a trade in clout, right? The celebrity agrees to have their name associated with the business in exchange for their own branded products or their own sub-brand. And most likely they don't invest any of their own money in it. But that can depend on the situation and that of the celebrities probably going to get a cut of the profits as well. Whereas the stamp approach serving regular individuals is a monetary trade where the person buying the stamp could pay anywhere from $10,000 up to $100,000 or more. Typically what is offered in these stamp deals is the person gets to utilize the brand name and have it connected to their own personal brand, while also getting a blueprint of how to market and jug your sub brand. Now at this point, this business model of selling anyone their own sub brand is pretty widespread and people are doing it all over. And so these business models of selling anyone their sub brand is pretty widespread. And now because there are so many people doing this, the deals can vary, right? Some deals may get you unique genetics. Some deals might not. Some deals you may, you know, get this or that, but really at the very core that all of these stamp deals have is that you get to utilize a prominent brand name to help bolster up your own sub brand. Now, I want to be very, very clear about this, right? Is it worth it to buy a stamp or not? And really the answer is it depends. The thing about buying a stamp is it really comes down to how far the person buying the stamp is willing to take it. How hard are you willing to work? How effectively are you going to leverage the overall brand name you bought the stamp from? 
Do you actually understand how much work is going to take? Do you have a network that is optimized to help you succeed? Do you have an actual long-term plan? Have you taken into account what's going to happen when everything goes legal and is regulated, right? These are the questions that you need to be asking yourself before purchasing a stamp, in my opinion. See, we're in a very unique time right now because it's just started. This whole new industry, it's just started. So it's hard to see how many of these people that have purchased stamps have been successful and made money. I think there are plenty of cases where people have made some really good money. I'm sure there are cases where people haven't made any money though. But this is the short term. We're talking about the long term. Long term, well, the only way we're gonna be able to see that is just wait. It's really only a time will tell kind of thing. I would say that Luca and Gumbo is by far the most successful stamp buyer in the country to date. I mean, they shot so far up, they ended up leaving the sub brand status under Jokes Up and ascended to full brand status and now sells their own stamps. And like I said earlier, Luca and Alex were perfectly positioned in many ways to ascend above the Jokes Up sub brand status. Given the fact that they have such a powerful network and they both are hardcore hustlers that know how to work and network. They also tested the viability of the stamp sub-brand model with having their own gumbo sub-brand and that of the fly trap gumbo brand. The story goes that Luca and Alex were testing some new flavors with the legendary rapper Jadakiss and Jada got so geeked, he called it a fly trap. And so that's the origin of the fly trap name. Now, if I had to make a recommendation, I think Luca and Alex should continue to build out the Flytrap sub-brand and showcase the different strategies and methods in helping that sub-brand be successful so that the folks buying stamps from them will have some more examples and instructions of how they can be successful with their own sub-brand. Maybe even create SOPs or standard operating procedures for marketing and other business operations. Anyways, like I said earlier, this stamp selling model is extremely new, which is also inside of a brand new industry. That's just starting, so we'll have to see how this all turns out in the future, but yeah, only time will tell. But please, if you buy a stamp, be very aware and understand what you're getting yourself into and have a plan to succeed. Anyways, I have to really commend Luca and Alex because really what they did that made them so successful is they adapted, observed, pivoted, and implemented in a pretty rapid amount of time. And in a lot of ways, that's entrepreneurship at its core. Now, in November 2022, which is last month as of this recording, Cookies and Gumbo released a press release announcing that Cookies and Gumbo were entering into an official partnership. Now, what are the exact details of this partnership? I'm not really sure, but if I had to guess, either Cookies made an investment or in the Gumbo brand, or they're doing some sort of distribution deal. And, you know, we'll have to see. I don't really know the details on the specifics of that. We'll probably find out here in the future. Now, why would Luca and his wife, co-founder Alex Major, want to do this? Well, by going into a partnership with Cookies and Burner, it guarantees that the Gumbo brand will have multi-state distribution in all of the cookie stores around the country. Another huge advantage that they're going to benefit from in this partnership is getting more access and developing the different flavors and genetics for their brand and their sub-brands. It's definitely going to be extremely interesting to see how the Gumbo and Cookies brand partnership will develop in the future. I personally think the future is looking very bright for the Gumbos. And really, when we think about why Burner and Cookies wanted to make this partnership happen, I think it really involves, you know, Burner wanting to ensure that he has a solid infrastructure in establishing himself in New York with the Cookies brand, which is one of the biggest markets in the country. And as of this recording, the entire world. Yeah, New York is one of the big four markets in the US, right? There's California, New York, Florida and Texas. These four markets are absolutely going to be extremely hyper competitive given the concentrated populations and therefore bigger consumer markets. The thing about bringing a brand into a new market like New York is you need to have local movers and shakers on your side helping you out of state brands, in this case cookies, assimilate into the local cultures and overall zeitgeist of the local population. And what better way to do that than to partner with Luca Brasi's gumbo brand as well as partnering with the legacy operator and that of the legendary Branson. By the way, I mentioned this earlier, but if you haven't seen that high design history episode I did on Branson, I highly recommend you go and watch that. 
But anyways, like I said, the partnership and overall market entry strategy that Burner and the Cookies team has been executing on in New York has been really impressive to observe. It seems that it's a culmination of all the things the Cookies team learned when entering into other markets prior. They've really started to hone in on what worked for them and failed for them in entering into those other markets in the past. As each new state opens up, it looks like Cookies is just getting stronger and stronger when it comes to their strategy and their entry into new markets. I think Burner and his team have really been innovative in their marketing strategies for entering new markets. And a big part of that is how do you assimilate your brand into each unique local culture? And side note, I also think a company named TRP has been a big help with market entry for Cookies on more of the logistical side of things. But yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how the full rollout and market entry for Cookies is going to pan out in New York. But so far, Cookies has been pitching almost a perfect game, and we're in the sixth inning. Three more to go. It's going to be absolutely fascinating to observe. Now to get back to the gumbos, I think some of the major themes I've noted when researching and analyzing the Luca Brasi, Alex Major story, it really involves adaptation, persistence, resilience, and patience. See, like y'all saw earlier in the video, Luca is a real deal entrepreneurial hustler, someone who has sold all types of different products, adapting to new circumstances and being persistent in his endeavors. And I would say the same goes for Alex. See, really what can be hard for so many people is getting back up after they've been knocked down multiple times. But that's the nature of success. You need to have resilience so you're able to get back up, brush your shoulders off, and then adapt and try to succeed a different way. For many, getting knocked down multiple times for many, many years pushes them to give up. But this is where patience and persistence comes into play. Success is rarely planned out to the T. Usually that success comes from unexpected areas. And see what Alex and Luca have in common is their shared experience in helping rappers and musicians reach success, but continuously struggling to help themselves. And what I mean by that in helping themselves, it comes down to investing in themselves and a product, a brand, an idea it represents. This is what entrepreneurship is, folks. And I'm talking about entrepreneurship that is looking for the long-term generational wealth. Whereas most people work for a company and help build up that company, they may sometimes get some stock, some ownership, but really, when the business becomes wildly successful and let's say it gets bought out for millions or even billions of dollars, more times than not, if you don't have any stock or ownership in it, you're going to make no money. And when it comes to the music business, I think this principle of ownership becomes much more apparent in your face. I mean, imagine seeing all of these rappers, your friends that you helped and worked with to help blow them up, made all of this money and got all this fame while you get nothing seemed like that would sting and build a potential resentment or a big chip on your shoulder. Now what Alex and Luca did, because they definitely do have those chips on their shoulder, is they used it as motivation to work harder, to refine their entrepreneurial muscles and find a path to success. And that's what they did. You don't need to be a famous rapper to be successful. You don't need to be a professional basketball player. You can be the greatest thing of them all an entrepreneur. Because at the end of the day, what are all of the rappers and pro sports players doing when they finish their careers? Well, a lot of them want to be entrepreneurs. Now, that is to say that being an entrepreneur is one of the hardest occupations in the world. So don't think it's not going to take a lot of work, but it's doable. But you need to believe in yourself because just like Luca has talked about in interviews before, no one really is going to believe in you at first. Really, you're only going to have yourself to believe in. Please make sure to hit the like button, share this, subscribe, and follow me on all the socials. Big shouts out to Alex Major and Luca Brazi and all the gumbos. And big shouts out to Burner and Cookies. Big shouts out to you for watching. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed this High Design QP episode. This is LMC, signing out.
backyard of a mansion, which led down to the water where a massive 110-foot yacht was stocked. There was lawn that was covered in local officials, law enforcement officers, and politicians sipping cocktails and mingling as they watched fireworks display in the distance. Little did they know that the fundraiser for wounded police officers was being thrown by one of the most successful drug smugglers on the East Coast at the time. A life of opulence and luxury, a beautiful family, a fleet of extraordinary vehicles, and a breathtaking mansion by the Atlantic Ocean. This was the life of William F. Lamorte, a man who seemed to have it all. From hosting extravagant parties on his lawn to his involvement in county politics, it appeared that his wealth was earned through his chain of grocery stores. But in 1991, everything unraveled when he was sentenced to 50 years in prison and fined a staggering $49.2 million. Welcome to the Trap Tree series. My name is LMC. If you guys are new to the channel, please make sure to hit the like button, subscribe, comment down below, and follow us on all the social medias. The links are down below in the description. Anyways, this is LMC. Let's run it. As it turned out, William F. Lamorte was the mastermind behind a vast international drug smuggling operation. Today, we delve into the life of William F. Lamorte, who he was, what did he do in thought smuggling history, and how was he eventually caught? So William F. Lamorte was stupendously wealthy, masterminding a criminal enterprise that spanned from Colombia to Thailand. Now, Lamorte's operation involved the daring importation of pot, hashish, into the United States on a large scale. The illicit venture was incredibly profitable, but also it relied closely on a group of Lamorte's associates and a shadowy network of smuggler friends. Among some of Lamorte's closest smuggler friends was Jacob Moritz, who mysteriously vanished along with two other co-defendants before law enforcement could close in on them. We'll get to Moritz later, but for now, let's focus on Lamorte. So as mentioned earlier, Moritz, right, and the two other defendants in the case managed to evade justice, and Lamorte was not so lucky as he would eventually face his day in court. Following an extensive federal trial in March of 1991, Lamorte was found guilty and subsequently handed a 50-year prison sentence. This punishment sent shockwaves through the legal system, especially because in addition to his hefty punishment, Lamorte was ordered to pay a staggering $49.2 million in fines. On top of that, the drug kingpin was also compelled to forfeit a colossal sum of $25 million worth of assets. But then again, that leads us to the million dollar question. How was Lamorte able to hide such a large smuggling enterprise for years? Before we jump back into the video, I just wanna say big thank you to Dr. Smoke for supporting this content. If you guys go over to drsmoke.com and use my discount code LMC, you're gonna get 15% off your entire order. Again, that's gonna be LMC, 15% off at drsmoke.com. They got all different types of products. Anyways, big thank you to the homies over at Dr. Smoke. Without them, this none of this would be possible, so I can't thank them enough. Now, let's jump back into the content. Well, in a revealing jailhouse interview with the Suffolk Times, this well-known businessman revealed it all. So according to the interview, Lamorte orchestrated the transportation of illicit substances from freighters anchored miles offshore through Gardner's Bay to family-owned properties in Southold, using smaller boats to execute this scheme. The efforts of the police on this case yielded tremendous results, and there was more than enough evidence of Lamorte's involvement in drug smuggling. In spite of all of that, throughout his incarceration, Lamorte remained steadfast in his claim that he should not have been convicted, especially since, according to him, he had ceased his involvement in drug smuggling years prior to his arrest. Anyway, on his arrest and trial, the government presented a compelling case alleging that William Lamorte was the head of a substantial, highly profitable organization engaged in illicit smuggling of pop. Their claim suggested that the operation had successfully infiltrated the country with nearly 120 tons of pot since as far back as the 1970s. Several key figures within Lamorte's organization, including William's own brother, Thomas, the boat crew members, and other individuals also provided testimony to support the government's case. Although these detailed statements painted a vivid and comprehensive picture of the inner workings of Lamorte's extensive smuggling network, in particular, the testimonies of Thomas Lamorte and Steve Garrison, the captains of some of the vessels involved in the smuggling activities, revealed that between 1970 and 1977, Lamorte had been the driving force behind the large-scale importation of pot from regions such as Jamaica, Colombia, and Morocco. In fact, the testimonies revealed that on one occasion, Lamort even took it upon himself to personally transport pot from ships into his property in Suffolk, New York. He even used his own boat, the Mary Poppins. 
Thomas Lamort further disclosed that in 1977, Lamort expanded his operations to include the importation of hashish from Lebanon. And then by 1981, William Lamort started to set his sights on importing pot from Thailand. Now, several of his associates, including Leland Darp, Philip Christensen, and John Corman, who were involved in the Thai venture, gave consistent accounts of Lamort's role. Specifically, they recounted a pivotal meeting in 1983 during which Lamort discussed the various grades and prices of Thai pot, voicing his concerns about the poor sales due to the moldy products. Now, shortly afterward in 1985, the Thai operation came to an abrupt halt when U.S. Customs and the Coast Guard intercepted a fishing trawler, the Oregon Beaver, which was loaded with 22 tons of Thai flour off the coast of San Francisco. With his back against the wall, Lamorte presented two stout defenses to shield him from the supposed allegations. Firstly, he contended that the government's witnesses were nothing short of unreliable. In his opinion, the investigations from the government were simply a malevolent attempt to tarnish his name. Something to know about Lamort is that he was a very eloquent man. With his words, the drug kingpin painted a picture of witnesses who, according to him, traded their testimony for the prospects of a milder punishment, leaving him to face the grim reality of an extended stay behind bars. But he didn't just attempt to discredit the witnesses, he even discredited the prosecutor. During his closing statement, Lamort cast a suspicious shadow over the prosecutor by claiming that he was involved in a conspiracy that went all the way up to the highest ranks of the government authority. Of course, the government responded by mounting a staunch counteroffensive. After all, there was a whole mountain of evidence, not to mention that the corroborating testimonies from all of the witnesses involved. But regardless, the damage had been done. Lamort's comments about the witnesses, prosecutor, and the government had struck a chord with the public. But Lamort was not done. His second line of defense rested on the premise that he quit the underworld a long time before he was eventually arrested. According to him, even if he had indeed dabbled in the world of drug smuggling, he had deliberately severed his connections to the underworld by the latter half of September of 1984. And based on this, Lamort argued that he had no reason to be prosecuted and incarcerated. Now to support this claim, Lamort summoned witnesses with testimonies that implied that he had made a clean break from the drug world. Now, the government, however, swiftly countered with a host of evidence indicating that Lamort's fingerprints could still be found all over the operation right into 1984 and even 1985. Now, the whole back and forth between Lamort and the government took quite a while. In fact, it was so exhausting that after six prolonged days of agonizing deliberation, the jury had still not reached a decision. Finally, on the seventh day, Judge Edelstein, with stern resolve, administered an Allen charge. Basically, an Allen charge is when the jury is struggling to reach a decision, and the judge advised them to get those in the minority to change their decision. And shortly after, the jury returned with a verdict. They found him guilty. Now, not surprisingly, Lamort did not take the decision lying down. And so following the court's decision, Lamort began an arduous appeal process in which he raised two pivotal objections to the proceedings. His first contention had to do with prosecutor's statements, and apparently the prosecutor had said that the government was too busy to pursue innocent individuals, and according to Lamort, the statement unfairly colored his case in the eyes of the jury. Ironically, even though Lamort maintained that the prosecutor's statement was indeed improper, he did concede that the mishap was minor in nature and that in the grand scheme of things, it did not deprive him of a fair trial. Now, turning his attention to the second objection, Lamort vigorously contended that the district's court instruction on withdrawal confused the jury. Now, according to him, the whole thing made the jury incapable of grasping the nuances of his defense. However, he still conceded that the courts effectively conveyed the essence of his withdrawal theory. And thus, this weight of the evidence, the complexities of legal arguments, and the solemn duty of justice carefully considered, the district court stands made its decision. First, it declared that the objections raised by William Lamort did not, in the eyes of the law, warrant a reversal of the verdict. In the court's view, justice had been served and the prosecution's case withstood the scrutiny of the most diligent legal examination. This meant that Lamort had no case and would have to serve his time as decided by the court. And this takes us back to one of Lamort's closest friends, Jacob Moritz. As mentioned earlier, Jacob Moritz was instrumental in establishing the smuggling operation alongside Lamort. And so when Lamort entered legal hot water, Moritz also found himself in similar trouble. Now, Moritz was apprehended in the early hours of April 15th, 2018, while attempting to cross the Canadian border near Rexford, Montana, as detailed by the U.S. Customs and Border Protection. Now, the efforts of Border Patrol officers were initiated in response to a tip-off regarding two individuals behaving suspiciously, emerging from a wooded area near the border. However, in the end, the fate of Moritz ended up very differently than that of Lamort's following his arrest. Moritz secured his freedom on bail, 
The court demanded a $100,000 bond, which Moretz posted in April 2018, as generously provided by his sons, the accomplished attorneys Jonathan and Dylan Runza. As of 2019, Moritz resided with his wife in a Tampa apartment, living under the watchful eye of GPS monitoring and adhering to a daily curfew as stipulated in court records. Now, Lamort, on the other hand, died in prison on July 4th, 2007, at the age of 60, having lost several appeals for his conviction. Successful drug dealers create a public persona to explain their wealth and lifestyle, and William F. Lamort did this by becoming an active member of his community playing a role of successful businessman and upstanding citizen. But getting too close to law enforcement just draw more attention to his smuggling operation. And also, do you think it's fair that in a lot of ways, just because Moritz got away, you know, he's under a lot less scrutiny. The one thing that needs to be highlighted in this series is that, yes, I don't think that, you know, La Morte smuggling H and other harder substances was good. There are a lot of people that smuggled this plant that they were caught in the past where the drug laws were a lot harsher. Some of these people, you know, died in prison like Lamort did, whereas his companion Moritz, who, you know, only got caught in 2018, you know, is only on GPS monitoring, right? It's very, very different. Anyways, really appreciate you guys for watching this episode of the Trap Tree series. What's your thoughts on this? Let me know down below. Please make sure to hit the like button, subscribe, comment down below, all that good stuff. Follow us on all the social medias. Links are down below. Anyways, this is LMC signing out. Peace. With this story, I think it's pretty interesting. I think it's an interesting story. It's almost like a little bit like The Great Gatsby slightly, but definitely an interesting story of how, you know, this man, you know, got so ingrained within county politics, within society, you know, was looked at this, you know, as this great Samaritan, but, you know, happened to be really, you know, pushing packs on the side, really not on the side as his main thing. Interesting stuff though. I really appreciate you guys for joining me on this episode of the trap tree series if you guys are new to the channel please hit the like button subscribe comment down below let me know what you guys think about this whole story definitely follow me on all the socials the links are down below in the description anyways guys this is lmc signing out absolutely what what's your thoughts on some of the trap shops that are here i mean the market is going to decide it so until there are that many white market legal shops open selling high quality just for a decent price you know, until all those criteria are met, these will continue to exist in some level, whether it's, you know, openly on the street like it is now or semi underground or, you know, I respect what anybody who has a pop open entity and they're out doing what they're doing, you got to respect it. It just is what it is. You cannot like people. You cannot like people's business models. You cannot like the, the groups and the crowds that hang around and support certain brands. And then at the end of the day, Respect all of it because here in New York City, this shit is the battle of the feast. Everybody's in the jungle, it's a war. Everybody's trying to do something. Every corner got something going on. You think it's not going on, things are going on. You know what I mean? So it gets crazy. It's for the ass. I'm chilling, you already know. So that's why I love it over here. We got a lot of people. I understand they're creating task forces now. There are, you know, OCM. I've seen personally raids of shops with my own eyes, OCM jacket, you know. But the thing is, a few OCM jacket, jacketed, you know, officers and a, a few teams of NYPD assigned to them or whatever, that's nothing. You know, this is a market that not only existed, but thrived back when there were 36,000 police officer officers in New York City alone charged with stopping that and God knows how many more federal officers and that couldn't stop it it thrived the answer to that was legalization so you're saying how do we police the illegal shops out of existence make them legal give them licenses well they they make things so complicated I don't even know if they know what they're doing yet you know like how much is it gonna be what are the license costs who are they gonna let have it you know like Yeah, I know, I feel like it's such an op opposition or like, you know, a negative thing to say, but it's not a threat, you know? I don't mean to say that guys like me are gonna continue doing this if the licenses are not fair or if the licenses aren't being given out, we're gonna keep doing what we're doing. That's just the market. If it's not me, it's someone else.
They would like they used to you know drink outside the, the bodega. Yeah. Cops would come in, shake it up, blah blah blah. blah. Two hours later, you know one person get arrested. Maybe two two hours later, they're back so, out. They're oh, back they out there. Shop just, over. Yeah. <laughs> They used to lock my work up, and 20 minutes later, I have another building because we were so weak, I didn't give up. Yeah. Real shit. Yeah. 20 minutes later. No, and then when I seen I was getting too many workers locked up, I went and I changed the whole lock mechanism and drilled the hole in the building I was trapping from, and now I had people buying through there. And then the police never could get in there. They were frustrated. And then they backed one of my workers when they ain't got the key. Yeah. They came and opened the door. They were smiling. I paid $1,200 for the locksmith to put a new one. 20 minutes, 30 minutes later. You try to come and rain one time, yeah. Well, uh, different lock motherfuckers. I think that this problem's gonna be almost worse. I think this thing's almost gonna be worse than Cali to a certain degree because of how defiant, how like like you're saying the attitude right there. Yeah. That's that's New York. That's New York. That's like that's why it's legal now because yeah. we sweat everywhere constantly. But I know it's not New York City, the Big Apple, the mecca of capitalism, of hustlers, one of my favorite places in the country and a place that I've been traveling to quite a bit. So in this episode, it's gonna be a little bit of a different format that I've never really done before. I'm actually bringing in someone new to actually do part of this video. Big shouts out to Ian. I just recently started working with him. By the way, if you're looking to potentially work with me, send me an email with your resume. I've got a number of different spots open, so tap in with your boy. But New York, the Big Apple, man, this one's gonna be fascinating to see this all turn out. But at the end of the day, what I will say before we jump into really the meat of this video, New York lawmakers, do not be greedy here because trust me, you can ask the people in LA, you can ask California, y'all could potentially end up like that. Let people compete, don't lock people out of the market, and of course, make sure you're looking out for the consumer above all. I've been jugging since I was 13, and that's what I learned when I was 13, 14. You learn the basic tenets when you start when you start out joking. And as time went on, I started to really break down these, these different major principles, like the baseline of selling flour. It's ease of access. How easy is it to get? Price. Is the price good? And is the quality, the quality good? And right now, the way that they're setting up New York, all of those things are in favor of the illicit market. And I'm personally a fan of the illicit market because if the illicit market is great because it checks these lawmakers. If lawmakers try to artificially do some, some sneaky business or some stupid moves, the market will check it. These changes aren't made in New York. Long live the illicit market and the gray market because they gonna check you. They gonna check you. Anyways, make sure to hit the like button. Make sure you subscribe if you're not subscribed. Definitely go follow me on all the social medias. The links are down below in the description. I'm talking Twitter, Discord, all that good stuff. Anyways, this is LMC. Let's run it. And before we go on, I just want to thank our friends over at GetSeedsRightHere.com. Get 10% get off your entire order at GetSeedsRightHere.com by using my code LMC10 at checkout. Get high quality clones and seeds at GetSeedsRightHere.com. Now, let's jump back into the video. Your favorite flower shop might not be here tomorrow. An economic bubble is building that could destroy the flower industry as we know it. It has become a full spectrum market, pun intended, from the legacy market to the legal market with every shade of gray in between. What I mean by that is, in every legal market, there are brands that start off completely compliant with state regulation, but as time goes on, they're forced to either close up shop or resort to gray market practices. In some areas, 80 to 90% of these flower shops are operating in the gray market. The overwhelming extent of this gray market has a lot to do with the length of time it takes for a state to transition from legalization to its first sales. For example, if you're California and you decide to legalize a commodity, yet not legalize the sale of it, you end up incentivizing the entire market of America's second most lucrative cash crop to start up business without the fear of harsh penalty. California legalized medical use back in 1996 with Prop 215, but adult use sales wouldn't be available for another 20 years. California basically trained their entire flower market to shop in the black market for an entire generation of people. Typically it takes three to five years for a state to announce legalization and to open up their first store. If you can't match the demand, the people are going to get their supply elsewhere, especially with low consequences and high convenience. And when it comes to convenience and the gray market, in New York, you'll find all 50 shades. 
First, you have your classic New York City neighborhood bodegas. Some aren't completely outright explicit. These could fall into the category of the secret members only shops that do everything by the book, from having passcodes to checking IDs with a scanner to ensure that you're on their list. But then you have your more explicit shops. Going back to the bodegas and local convenience stores, many aren't afraid of outright saying that they have flour available. You see the same trend with the former glass shops that have decided to transition into the flower market without going through the licensing process. Some keep things low key with their stock in the back, while others make it loud and clear what they have available right in front. But perhaps no one is louder than the street teams of the exotic snacks and drink shops all around the city. Typically, these are the shops with the loud, colorful product labeling and loud, colorful street promoters trying to pull you into their shops. After talking with one of my local sources out there, he painted a picture saying, they might as well just say, we launder money on the business sign right out front. But what if I told you there's someone even more brazen than anyone else, possibly in the history of the gray market? Weeks ago, reports dropped saying Jungle Boys are illegally operating literally across the street from the New York City Hall, just a couple hundred feet away. Two problems with this. One, that's not the real Jungle Boys. Someone literally built an entire store disguised as a legit Jungle Boys retail store Everything from Jungle Boy's flower to Jungle Boy's merch is being impersonated up to the scale of an entire store and right across the street from City Hall. The second problem with this is what does this do to the Jungle Boy's brand itself? This results in their brand getting watered down with products and services that aren't actually theirs. I also noticed the way a lot of these articles read, it was as if the Jungle Boys were actually operating without a license. You'll maybe find a single mention that this is a fake Jungle Boys, with most of the article continually referring to the store as Jungle Boys and the employees as Jungle Boys employees. So I definitely want to take the time to make it absolutely clear that this store is not the real Jungle Boys. Guys like Ivan worked entirely too hard to build their brand for mainstream media to play things off as if they're an illegal operation. Especially since after taking the store down, literally just a couple weeks later, it was fully reopened and restocked with only a $250 fine. They're back in business and it looks like they're gonna remain that way for now. For one, a $250 fine isn't making anyone flinch. I paid bigger fines for having loud parties in college. But also keep in mind, a store that goes out of their way to fake an entire Jungle Boys brand from top to bottom will also plan for these raids. I'm telling you, it's literally in their budget. They have the means to restock and keep it moving almost indefinitely compared to the funds the police have to take it down. The demand is too high, especially for brands like Jungle Boys, where people who aren't even that familiar with flour have already begun to associate the brand with the plan itself. On the streets, consumers aren't really too worried whether it's legal or not. If the price is right and it looks good, it's a sale. Plus, the competition against legal recreational brands in cities like New York only offer greenhouse grown flour, typically a lower quality than the indoor quality that most connoisseurs have grown to love. This pushes buyers back into the black and gray markets to get the flour that they're looking for, which in turn keeps these trap shops well funded. It really comes down to the landlord to do something about it. They control the rent and ultimately who operates in their space. But if these trap shops are pulling in more money than your legal ones, who's able to afford more rent? Even if a landlord decides to raise the rent to ridiculous prices, what happens if the tenant can afford those prices? Does the landlord become satisfied with the higher rent that the tenant is now providing? The landlord knows they won't be seeing that kind of money by switching them out with a legal shop, not with this current market. So it's actually in the landlord's best interest to simply charge month to month, play things by ear, and allow these trap shops to operate and restock after each raid. No security deposit, no first or last month's rent, just a fat monthly check to repeat the process as many times as necessary. But perhaps what makes New York vastly different from the other markets in the US are its mobile businesses. You have U-Haul moving vans being rented out and converted into marketplaces on wheels. This avoids ever having to worry about any landlord in the first place. And at the same time, you have the folding table culture of the city as well, where on any sidewalk, you might run into a table full of product being sold by a random guy just chilling on a stool. He's got his head on a swivel and ready to take off if needed. But in the case of the U-Haul van, you're really only worried about commercial parking and avoiding getting a boot on one of your wheels, which again, is a small enough fine to get it removed and carry on like nothing happened. And like I said, it's literally in their budget for many of these more elaborate operations, especially if they eliminated the cost of a storefront. So with all that being said, what's the solution? 
To be honest, when doing research on this topic, I thought the answer to the solution would be to ensure that your state transitions into the adult use market sooner than later to avoid pumping the gray market. But when we look at New York, the speed at which the gray market took over and the scale is almost something to marvel. Even just days ago, March 3rd, 2023, they passed legislation that literally doubled the number of recreational licenses available. That takes them from 150 legal adult use shops to 300. But even with these early years of New York legislation, having even thousands of these licenses wouldn't be fast enough to compete against the gray market. The solution isn't about racing to see who gets to the market first anymore. The real problem boils down to the greed of those who decide to unfairly regulate the market in their benefit. Specifically, I'm talking about the lawmakers and regulators who give in to the requests of those taking advantage of the situation. That's where it starts and stops. This pretty much was proven with Colorado, who've had their own version of California's Prop 64 and have managed to have a much better outcome. Dennis Perrin, who is considered one of the pioneers of legalization, predicted that a tier system with multiple tax jurisdictions and excessive labeling requirements would lead to smaller shops and grows being stomped out by larger corporations. It takes some level of foresight to have a tier licensing system without compromising competition, or to have different tax jurisdictions without any of the localities overtaxing just because you can, or to be conscientious of proper labeling that the community actually needs versus what regulators want. This requires control over the primal human instinct and emotion of greed. With that control, we can see how similar legislation applied in two different states can deliver vastly different results. It's literally a mindset that is the difference between California and Colorado, which resulted in key differences in execution rather than the legislation itself. However, to be fair, Colorado didn't have to deal with the excessive number of companies that were fully established in other states coming in to manipulate the legislation or market themselves. Nowadays, with places like New York, you'll have Big Corp operating elsewhere in multiple states with high-level funding helping to guide the new rules and regulations in the upcoming market. From there, they can get things set up to immediately come in and crush the competition with legislation like high taxes, having strenuous zoning, environmental and safety standards, and limited licensing to keep the number of legal competitors low. This then chases away the mom and pop shops from even considering entering the market and opens up the competition for gray and black market competitors that are willing to bend or break the rules. However, the big companies are playing the long game. They have the capital to influence and purchase their licensing and facilities and hold out while the smaller competitors eliminate one another. And they could keep this position until the market is ready to be properly regulated. This essentially means I believe a lot of the biggest moves in the industry won't be made until this is federally legalized. When this inevitably becomes federally legal, that will mean a universal guideline will be put in place in terms of safe banking, competition, and taxes. Businesses will be able to fully operate with all forms of payment beyond cash without any of today's banking hassle. But more importantly, federal regulation will likely have the budget to actually enforce what cities and smaller jurisdictions can't with higher level penalties and sentencing. In return, companies would now be able to incorporate tax write-offs into their businesses, potentially cutting their overall tax burden in half. Right now, some experts say if you operate in California's flower market 100% legally, then you're lucky if you're making 10% profit. But what then? Does the government move in and eliminate these gray market shops? I would actually suggest not. Do you think we're on the same path to, to California? Ultimately, the question is how much faster will we do it? Yeah, because uh, California likes to take its time. New York is fast. I think we're gonna, we're gonna cut through all that and maybe in two, three years, we'll be able to do what California took. 10, 15 years to get to, yeah. uh, you know, where they developed collectives and, and other ways of bringing and in, including uh, the gray market that they could not eliminate into the fold. You know, so do I want to go there? I speak to other legacy guys. I get to go out now and get to meet all these guys and they're not happy, you know, like, so I want to do something for myself. So give me a micro license, something small that I can easily handle just by myself. Let me grow my own, sell my own. You can test it, take whatever taxes you want, I'm good. Absolutely. But let me get it. And there's a chance you're not gonna be able to do that. I don't know. How many are they gonna give out? I don't play politics. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not interested in that. You know, I have other friends that are involved. I don't really like political events. You know, I'm just jaded. 
Yeah. You know, and I just don't trust. This is this is what's happening. Look, we had to make a This is what's happening right now. They trying to go and play ball. They see what they brought them got offers from the mayor and stop to help the cultivators in New York learn how to grow and get drinks and possibly get your social equity. How am I going to possibly that really to do all that? First of all, let's ask all that. You just asked me. Yeah. How am I even possibly gonna get my shit when I'm supposed to guarantee well, that I'm so tranquil? This is the perfect social equity candidate. So how I gotta even do all this extra work, right? Because they need they need they need a little payment, bro. They bro need a little... I live where I live at. There's yeah. four of the largest groves yeah. in New York State. Yeah. 260 acre, 400 acre. Yeah. Minutes away from my estate. I live in that estate, I gotta say that. Yeah, yeah. From, what, what area? You know? I can't tell you area. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, up there. It's, not my, doing it. it's up there. You, you, if you know, you know, it's so all the all the farms is that. Those are the ones that got grand, grandmother didn't, grandfather didn't remember, um, to be, to grow outdoor or whatever. Yeah. But um, they all, one of them is my landscaper. And he blows me up every day. Yo, I need help. I said, yo, I buy all those pounds, I'll 200. No, I could bag them up and make 2,800. I said, whoa, I said, there's three dispensaries in New York. That's legal, I got 2,400 pounds. That's 700 million stuck in New York right now, outdoor grow frozen. Right now. And they gotta sell 700 million in three dispensaries. Only housing area is doing numbers. I don't know too much how the other two are, but I know they're not doing as good as housing. So that's why they're gonna fit, bro. They're gonna fit they're gonna, they're gonna do it too slow. They're gonna give out all the license way too slow. And then, they, well, it's already too entrenched. Well, I think at this point right now, like, you know, they're not gonna do it for us. So since we are the creators, we're gonna keep creative. And we're going to keep adding on to this. And before we go on, I just want to thank our friends over at GetSeedsRightHere.com. Get 10% off your entire order at GetSeedsRightHere.com by using my code LMC10 at checkout. Get high quality clones and seeds at GetSeedsRightHere.com. Now, let's jump back into the video. Hey, I'm back. So, great job, Ian, by the way. I want to say great job. Now, what when it comes to New York, really, what I need, what I think we need to see, is we need to see New York lawmakers start to expand the number of licenses out massively, start to try to quickly bring in the traditional market or the illicit market, these trap shops. Try to bring in as many, you know, of these as possible. Do not limit this. Do not go slow with this, because as time goes on and this doesn't get taken care of, the problems only get worse and worse and worse, and it's going to get more ingrained. And like I said a little earlier, very beginning of this, the illicit market is going to always check the legal market. And the enforcement is going to be so tough for New York because of how dense it is and how big it is and how many people there are. The amount of enforcement that's going to be needed to keep these artificial market conditions for these very few legal shops that are open, it's not possible. It's going to cost a lot of taxpayer money. And it's just stupid. Why not for the city of New York? Why not open this up? Let people really actually become, you know, tax paying companies that are, you know, in regulated and allow them to operate and compete. That's going to allow for the consumer to get better ease of access, better pricing, and hopefully better quality. That's kind of a different thing though when it comes to cultivation. Anyways, this is just, you know, my thoughts. We're going to be definitely expanding much more on this in the future with New York, and we're going to keep an eye on this, obviously. But I would love to know your thoughts down below. What are your thoughts about this overall situation? I personally think that we are on track to see New York end up like an LA or, you know, a Cali, right? Especially when we think about the cultivation aspect, too, because there's really no, but where is all this indoor high quality coming from? It's not coming from New York. <laughs> Anyways, there's a lot of problems. We're going to address them all here in the future. Definitely, definitely, definitely make sure to hit the like button. Make sure you share this. I'd love to hear your comments down below. Anyways, this is LMC signing out.
hundred percent can see the franchise and it is. And, and so you have kind of thought it out. Yeah, I just want to connect to all professionals on the scene, like nationally. However, we're gonna do that. We don't know yet, but there's gonna be a tool for that. Whether it's a space, whether it's online platform that we're developing right now. It has a community. Um, the same people are here often. There's great ideas being generated from it. There's drama and competition. You know, it's it's all here. Well, work and roll. We're talking about this place. Crazy. This is the place where everything starts. Hi, my name is Julia. I'm co-founder of Work and Roll, a co-working space, cannabis friendly, cannabis industry friendly um, in New York City. I would say from the business model perspective, this is our the main revenue stream, which is event venue, um, and also marketing tool for brands to expand to New York market because we're doing a lot of brand activations, we're doing the lounge parties for brands here with whatever they want to activate, whether they have smoking device and they want to bring customers and let them try this new thing or their brand of flower or their brand of whatever it is, you know? So as a brand, I mean, it's been exponentially helpful. Um, be, whether it be just being in the right place at the right time, but you know them culminating the right like a scenario for that to happen. Yeah, I mean this place really reminds me of Spain. Um, yeah, it definitely has like this you know Barcelona social club vibe to it, where it has a community. Um, the same people are here often. There's great ideas being generated from it. Um, seeing it sort of develop, uh, people trying to figure out where they belong, how they belong there. Uh, work and roll is like a market incubator in, in a lot of ways. And you can smoke at all of it. Like, it's pretty rad at the end of the day. Matt, Julie, Alex, they're doing an amazing job. This is like pioneers of the, of the culture. We're talking about consumption sites, right? Here, like people, even they, they don't have to be consumers. They can come just to work. It's also cool. But they cool with the vibe. They cool with the other people are high. We shouldn't be like closed for only for ourselves. We should be open and you know coexist with other you know like groups of people. It's like it's this is this fucking stigma what we are breaking, what we are fighting against. People think or you know somebody thinks that you know being a stoner means something, means another kind of another group, another aliens. I don't know like. No, it's absolutely normal, usual. It's like people go uh, at night and they, they have a few drinks and it's normal, it's the same, it's the same. So let's be like, you know, let's try to be together and coexist. And if somebody wants to come to your place and that place is a consumption site, so let them have this area, you know, like to, to work and just to be out of it. This place, I would say, is perfect for creatives, for business people, for like hardworking and entrepreneurs. So this is, I would say, more professional vibe. That's what I'm trying to keep. Uh, but every place is so niche and there is a need for all of the places, for all of the communities to be present and to enjoy their time. A lot of people just, like, they know each other from like somewhere, oh, someone told me, someone, na, 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 na. But they never met actually. And there is like this small windows where they can meet like events and okay oh you just have two hours at the event where you can have to meet all these people and you don't have time for that and it's just like i wanted to do something consistent where you can just come every day network get your business done get your stuff done and just you know connect to the people what's happening in new york right now is essentially it's like a whole other way for marijuana culture to express itself in a way that 
has not happened in this country before as, as, far, as nothing that I've experienced, you know? I love it because, you know, I, I drink, but not a ton, but like I'll go out for a beer now and again and stuff like that. But it's like cool to be able to go out and like have a smoke with friends in a place that has a certain vibe. It's like a cool experience that like is unavailable to pretty much everybody, you know? So it's great. There are a lot of introverts right now. Like, you know, like it's like every day, more and more. Uh, where you go to, to know other people? Museum, come on, let's, you know, like, let's be serious. Where you go, nightclub, no way, no fucking way. So this is maybe like the last, you know, like, I don't know how to say, the last uh, column of the socializing people. So why, you know, the consumption size, what's the benefit? The benefit to society is like in 2023, it's maybe only the only one thing that really unites people, you know, like people come and they see each other, they talk, they don't talk, they maybe just uh, consume and observe uh, other people or they just want other people to, to observe them. Now, I think these places are critical to exist, but without these places, it would be possible too, because like, we know how New York is, like all these boroughs, all these like, little communities, they just stay there, they just do their own thing. So without communication and this connection, it would be interesting too, you know, like so many things just happening, popping up at the same time. But with having those places, this is like how people from different cultures and different backgrounds just come together and create something more special and more beautiful, you know. And actually, like, just this need in a community space too, because like I'm... Um, I come from another country and it's like this need for community, this is like really, it feels really hard when you come to another place. And I've been traveling a lot to working from different places and just, you know, it was just wasn't this feeling where you can be like, oh my God, I'm home. You know, I, I just feel this community vibe. And we were like, okay, let's just do this ourselves and just, you know. Before we move on with the content, I want to say a big thank you to Dr. Smoke for supporting this content right here. So if you guys go to drsmoke.com, use my discount code LMC, you're going to get 15% off your entire order. And I highly recommend that you, know, you go to Dr. Smoke, order some stuff. They've got high quality stuff. They've got drinks. They've got all different types of goodies. They've got you know big brands, right? Um, all different types of brands, 3 g all different types of stuff. They've got all the types of candy, right? All super high quality, all tested, all good to go, all legal, delivered to your door. So go to drsmoke.com, use discount code LMC at checkout, get 50% off your order. And also this is gonna help you know support this content here. So if you wanna support the show, go try it out. Go to drsmoke.com, use my discount code LMC10, you get 50% off your order. Now let's jump back to the content. Whenever you do something where it's competitive, there's always ego involved. Not everyone's a Buddhist. And even if you are a Buddhist, there's rent to pay. I mean, if the regulators care about small businesses and they care about having like a healthy, strong cannabis economy, I feel like these places are critical. Would you, would you say so? Um, yes, but I would say that the government should help us with just monetizing those spaces because it's like just being the community space it doesn't make a living you know for it doesn't allow to have employees it doesn't you know there's like a lot of little parts and the state should figure out how this can be profitable for them too to make their tax money and for us to exist there's the potential for social change and, and a development of new ideas that can be applied to the market and beyond, but that's what makes social consumption dangerous, if you think about it from a political lens, and why 
the government hasn't rushed to allow it. I mean, I think the, the da most dangerous thing you can do is get a bunch of stoners that know how to navigate the internet and, <laughs> you know, cryptocurrency together and get them thinking on a high level and putting their energy together. That's a dangerous situation if you desire to keep the status quo. And so I've always thought about that from the consumption lens is like, Political, political control of hippies, the war on drugs, the control of black and brown communities, like, it's not just some conspiracy theory, it's, it's fucking real. So like, that, how does that continue? How does that continue to exist in why things aren't legalized or why Colorado still really doesn't have social consumption after all these years? It's already fading, right? The, the acid is wearing off and the, 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 the sun is coming up and people are trying to figure out where their shit is and how to, how to get home. The reality of, I, I would say it's like any art form, it either goes corporate or it dies, right? And so like we're in that period where you're either gonna go corporate or you're gonna die. How do you create communities without losing identity? Right? We can stay individual, but we can collaborate to create something. Like coming together to create content with, with other companies that may be competitive, why is that a bad thing? Like we're not, com we're really not competing with each other. We're competing with, and not not to be like whatever, but like Cresco, Curly, for whatever corporate cannabis. You're a small business trying to make it in a market that will be dominated by dollars sooner than later. It is already really in New York. Like places are opening, places are closing. Denver, California, all over the place. Like okay, let's try BYO. It's not working really because it's like you know place must sell something, time or products or something, or it should be what I was advocating for this whole time. It should be a sustainable business without cannabis, but if you add cannabis to this, this is even better. Like a restaurant, coffee shop, co-working, anything, yoga studio, Pilates studio. It should be sustainable just by itself as a business. And if you add a little infusion, that's, you know. Yeah, re retail is gonna be in trouble if this model becomes accepted. I mean, not only from like the legacy market, but like this place is gonna, this place is gonna have to be able to retail product in order to survive the same way that it's done in Spain, the same way it's done in Amsterdam. Like that will have to be the model. So that, so that'll, that has to be the model, right? And so it's, it's, Difficult. I always say this: like retail struggles. Be, most retail struggles because it lacks an identity, right? It just is a convenience store, it is a liquor store, and and they do it to themselves by failing to curate a menu, right? I need Stizzy. I need I need these things because if I don't have it, the person down the street will have it, and they'll, the customer will just go there. A lounge doesn't have that mentality. Like this place doesn't have that mentality. This place is going to put what it wants on the menu because it has an identity and it has a and it has a smaller consumer base, which is easier to understand and easier to thereby serve. So yeah, we'll see. Just this uncertainty with the regulations. This is just what drives all of the entrepreneurs crazy because we don't know what's going to happen. Like we can't predict the month from now. We can't do anything pretty much. We're just waiting, like, what's gonna happen? Cause, you know, it's like, they're figuring it out right now and we're like, waiting, you know, yeah, so. Yeah. All I say, like, you know, the, the, the weed business, the, the weed, it's like about passion. I, 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 I'm after that. I, I, I know that sometimes it's not possible. It's very complicated, expensive to do, but, Let's face it again, if you want to have a perfect place, it's like a restaurant, you open a restaurant, you want to be an amazing restaurant so everybody is going to talk about it, so do it proper. Be professional. I always say, I don't care what you do, be professional and I'm going to respect you. This is becoming a real actual business. It's not going to be trapping in five years or 10 years or whatever. And you know, you have to start treating it as such at some point and the time is now. That's kind of how I feel. A lot harder to Yeah. Population and desire. I mean, I don't, not to knock any other place, but like New York hustles hard, and we always have. Do you like it here more, or Europe, or I mean, the, the freedom of speech. This is like, you know, like freedom of speech and illegal cannabis. This is like what's perfect about this place. So. 
check the mic and make sure it sound right, boys. smoke order some stuff they've got high quality stuff they've got drinks they've got all different types of goodies they've got you know big brands right um all different types of brands 3g all different types of stuff they've got all the types of candy right all super high quality all tested all good to go all legal delivered to your door so go to drsmoke.com use discount code lmc at checkout Get 50% off your order. And also, this is going to help, you know, support this content here. So if you want to support the show, go try it out. Go to drsmoke.com. Use my discount code LMC10. And get 50% off your order. You telling me, show you, I know that nigga. I was either in jail with that nigga nah, or the on the streets or somewhere. Hit nigga. <laughs> When we did search, that shit was instantly special. It was like I followed the Runt's early program. You know, the whole candy things, using the Z at the end, just brainwashing with the marketing with the whole. And it worked, and everybody after trying to do that shit, it ain't working for them. Because the brand I already had behind it and me being the owner of it and what I've been doing for the last almost three decades. You know? And then this fucking prick right here. I know him since he first came from fucking Puerto Rico. He moved right in my fucking block in my building. Real smoky way in here. Come on, man. We've been doing music from the night from the late nineties, just pushing music with the piff unit shit, with my cousin Lumi's label, Logi Music. We just was pushing it because it was I was already serving every nigga in the industry. From yeah. 50 Cent to Wu-Tang to Matt Red, Red Man. Any rapper that was relevant in New York or even coming up was coming to my block. Or I was going right. to the studio when Nelly, when Pharrell Entertainment was out. I was around all the big dogs. Like I was like uh, 99, 2000, 2001, 2002. My shit was piffy and everybody knew about that. We had all the rappers rapping about that shit right. and coming to buy it. So, when it comes to like supplying the rappers, I don't think nobody was supplying them more than me. And I had the streets too. Cause I didn't have to be in the streets to have a whole, I never saw like, I have a fucking squad. From workers to managers to lookouts to stash crib. It was a whole fucking system. Now I'm from Harlem, Spanish Harlem, the east side, 119th Street, second half. Yeah. That block, you ask, you ask anybody about that block, they're gonna tell you, oh, it's still haze over there. You know what I'm saying? Just. It's culture for us. But well, for me, rather coming up, I, I just sort of leave my whole fucking life down there from starting to sell any drug. <laughs> well, back in the days, you mean? The Dominicans uptown, Dykeman, Heights, all Dominicans Omar. controlled that shit. Yeah. I was the first one to take that shit from the Heights and made it a bigger spot outside of the Heights. That was me. You go to any hate spot, the only first big hate spot was my spot that was acknowledgeable, that was huge, that was big. Niggas was all selling keys, man. Niggas was getting big money where I was from. We had niggas driving in cars with custom leather interior that come almost the same price as a car. Like this is how Harlem niggas do. Niggas spend 200,000 in jewelry and go to their house to their mother. Like, stupid shit. Yeah, you see, I went to jail for selling hard drugs. Some people. I did bids, so that was my reason for changing. A lot of people's gonna tell you shit off of stories that they see other people go through. I did the go through. So I needed a change, you know what I'm saying? And when I seen I could make just as much or more money, I see more profit. I slept better at night, you know what I mean? I still went to the feds though, I still went to state prisons, but it wasn't that much time. I still came out and I still did it. That's why I'm a legacy. These people can't call themselves a legacy. They never went to jail, never did a, 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 a life stop to come back and continue. That's what makes you legacy. 
not to fucking get caught once if you ever got caught and stop and then 20 years later New York go legal really? and we like yo I was doing now this I'm legacy now. 20 years ago I'm legacy nah I'm not legacy man even when I was in jail my, my wheels were still spinning I was still supplying the streets still nothing stopped there's not anybody can do this this shit comes with your with your background this shit comes with your face car your if you did grimy, if you, you if you're a good nigga, like this this game comes parameters. with a lot of that. And what I do, these people can't do. There's not one brand can do this. Why why am I the only one doing this? That's a brand in New York. Uh, partnerships. No not investors, nice. no None shit. It's just shit. me and my team. Rebot King. That's a fact, man. Go downstairs. You're gonna see real grown weed downstairs, bro. Right. You gonna look at these niggas bag, you're gonna get that triple A Jackie Chan. They used to lock my work up, and 20 minutes later, I have another nigga in the building. I didn't give a fuck. Real shit. I mean, it's the spirit in New York. That's why it's legal now, because we smoke everywhere constantly. We're not going to stop when it was illegal. You this fucked is, making this things. This is what's happening, though. You had to make it legal this is what's so happening we can right smoke. Now. Still, they still don't even know how I'm able to do this. Come on, bro, do the math. $70,000 a month. A month. Sometimes a little more. A month. We talking about you need 2300 2400 a day profit to keep the doors open. Half these people's not even making that for their life a day. I'm not, I'm not trying to shit on nobody. I'm just showing the people my job. What the fuck I got? Come on. They probably spending that money, but I'm not spending. I'm investing in, 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 in a business and in people to have a, a chance to make good money to live a good life. All of a sudden, they said it was a gateway drug our whole life. That's what, what, what it was for New York. If we smoked weed, bro, my parents would look at me like I was sniffing crack on cocaine. Like, right, right. Weed. This is how bad New York, the, the, the government had New York and, and the kids and the commercials. Okay, weed is a gateway drug. I've been seeing that shit since I was zero. Expanding. Safer to use that alcohol. And as much a part of growing up as smoking corn silk behind the back fence. And now you talking about, yo, you trying to figure out a crackdown on y'all niggas with 1,500. You motherfucking right, you got 1,500 dispensaries or whatever. You lucky you ain't got 10,000 of them shits. Well, we, the we should. Summer, we should have. I don't, I don't support the grocery store shit, but they doing dumb. But figure it out. Y'all put those laws no, out. Look, that's the same motherfucker telling you get the figure fuck out, out the store when you was doing that shit. Yeah, yeah. that's a fact. You feel me? Same nigga, but same selling, nigga that threw me out the, the store, store for selling weed, weed in the store want to sell weed now. It's bad enough I got to come in and buy the Duchess from you. No, it's bad enough. Now you want to sell the weed too? Let me take away everything from these anyway. niggas. Before we move on with the content, I want to say a big thank you to Dr. Smoke for supporting this content right here. So if you guys go to drsmoke.com, use my discount code LMC, you're going to get 15% off your entire order. And I highly recommend, you know, you go to Dr. Smoke, order some stuff. They've got high quality stuff. They've got drinks, all different types of goodies, big brands, right? All different types of brands, 3 g all super high quality, all tested, all good to go, all legal, delivered to your door. And also, this is going to help, you know, support this content here. So if you want to support the show, go try it out. Go to drsmoke.com. Use my discount code LMC10. You get 50% off your order. Now, let's jump back to the content. Shit, shit has been growing. The event's been growing. Yeah. yeah. The community's been growing. You know, a lot of fake shit, like, which you kind of brought up with the situations of, you know, the legalization and how, you know, the people that deserves it and is not getting it or even getting the attention for it. You know what yeah. I'm saying? It's become like a, you know, an obvious capital thing. Some of the people that's obviously even getting some of these licenses, I don't even think they even smoke. You know what I'm saying? No. That's the funny part. I went to like one, somebody actually dragged me to one, to one of the events, and it was just like a whole bunch of gibberish, you know what I'm saying? Good food, good little, getting that free liquor they get, you know, the sponsors from, you know, little enjoying the vibe, did the little nice little cocktails. Yeah, <laughs> it was nice. And I was like, yo, so what's going on here? And then, you know, they got their league, we, you know, legacy t shirts on, oh, and. Man. And it, they look they so. Kill me with that legacy shit. Yo, though. no, it's just like, like I'm understanding bro more. Like, you know, like, like, I'm not like acting like I know it all. I'm just a person that's actually learning every day more. And and it's it's been no cap. It's been real. Like we we actually created the market. You know what I'm saying? That's shit. what we've been doing. Nah, period. Nah, nah. I got a better better understanding that we are the market. 
Talk about it. Yeah, yeah, that is, I just, so when I'm, that yeah, legacy shit getting humble. pushed out, yeah. nah, fuck that. <laughs> this is the part. This is the part where we can't be humble. <laughs> like now, we, we, the goal is this, right? This is the next move. We're gonna start our own Grammys. We're gonna start highlighting the brands, upcoming ones that been around that been overshadowed. We're about to start giving people their flowers. You know what I'm saying? The Built the community. Giving credit to people yeah. who, who really did shit, right. you know, as opposed to who right. took that and who's popular for it. You know, they're not gonna do it for us. So since we are the creators, yeah. we're gonna keep creating yeah. and we're gonna keep adding on to, 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 to the environment. The yeah. But what, what I do wanna see eventually happen is coming together with, with a partner that can actually get, get us the outlets that we would need for a festival. And it'd be us, you, the community taking it out the, the box you know what i'm saying right. it's never been a box here anyway it's this shit has been yeah you know what i mean it's yeah. been going you know and it's been a blessing but the key is getting it to a point where we could like you see how you was in spain and i was like damn i was in la the weekend before you know organizing rolling search over there so it was like Right, going right. on now. They you know coming to us with motion. Yeah, they coming to us with motion. All the OG. You know what I'm saying? So, yo, yeah. it's like now I'm seeing it, the light. <laughs> All the hard work is paid, is paid off. You know what I'm saying? Right. And it's going to keep paying off. Because we you know still working. We still working. It's non stop every day. 100%. Like, I'm in a zone down that like, this is my sport right here. Yeah. This ain't just coming about. You know what I'm saying? Like, I've been ready for this. You know what I'm saying? And I'm still learning as I'm going as well. You know, as I'm going, as I'm growing, but at the same time, like, I already envision a lot of these moves. And like I said, I love this shit so much. I work with passion. I never come here with negativity, like, right. towards this shit. Right, never about being yeah. I don't bring my personal shit here. Work, you know, work, 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 work. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, it is what it is. They they, they, they all talk shit about me. Yeah. But absolutely. I love that shit because I've been talking shit about my whole life. And that shit comes with progress. Yeah. And wherever I'm at, you're going to hear me because if I'm on my jail time, I'm on a different time. If I'm on my getting money street time, I'm going to be able to come on my getting money street time. The ran for me, you hear me? Either way. Ran for me, you hear me? <laughs>